Apartments.com has helped millions of renters and could help you find your perfect place. And yep, I know perfect is a tall order, but if you're looking for an apartment or a condo, townhome or a house even, Apartments.com has all the right tools to help you find it. I've had to look for rental apartments in the past and it's always a massive pain with listings all over the place and information that I don't even know if I can trust. Apartments.com makes it so much easier with all the details you need in one trustworthy place. Use filters and save searches to narrow down rental listings and find exactly the place for you. You can even set up alerts to get notified as places become available. So fashionistas, get your closet space or an in-unit washer dryer. Sun lover, find as much natural light as you can handle. If you're working from home, you can have an area for your home office, an extra bathroom, a balcony, central heating and air, or a dishwasher in the kitchen. Whatever happens to be right for you, this is the place to find it. Apartments.com, the place to find a place. My mum's dog, Punky, rest in peace, was a very sweet and loving dog. She was an ESA dog, but trained to be a service dog for PTSD before she lost her leg. I had never really seen her get aggressive with anyone in, like, the entire 12 years that she lived. She never growled, or even nipped at anyone, and she had no sense of smell, so she loved all animals and people. A real gentle giant among our little terrier at 60 pounds. What I'm getting at here is that her barking at something and being aggressive was so wildly uncharacteristic that I really only ever saw it once. So I, an 11-year-old female, was at home with my siblings, two male and six female. My then stepdad is at work and my mum ran up to the gas station to grab a pack of cigarettes. It was only a mile or two away from us. For reference, we lived in a two-bedroom trailer in the middle of the woods, not a dead-end road at the time, and you had to really make an effort to get down our road, find our house, navigate down a, a rickety driveway, and find the door. I'm sitting at the computer having a grand time watching YouTube videos, I think, when all of a sudden, all of our dogs, about two Boston Terriers and one Chihuahua, perk up, bark a few times, and start investigating down the hall. My siblings were napping in the bedroom at the end of the hall at the time, so I figure that they just stirred and scared the dogs. But then Punky sits up suddenly, stands up on the couch, and puffs her chest out. Her ears are perked up, her fur standing on end, her tail straight up, and then she barks. Loudly, too. I mean, the bark booms through the living room and echoes around, and all of a sudden she lunges off the couch and goes tearing down the hallway... I'm already on edge because I don't think that I've heard her bark like this, like, ever. Her bark is more of a baying sound, I guess, because of her breed and everything, but this was a big, loud, and alert bark. I stand up and go to look down the hallway, ready to fight off what I'm assuming is a shadow monster in the hallway based on how the dogs are acting. But then I hear it. Three knocks. We never really got visitors because of how weird our house was, location-wise, so my 11-year-old mind had no clue what to do here. The only people who showed up were family, and they never knocked. So I, I slowly walked towards the door. The knock drew the attention of the dogs, and they came running back down the hallway, all except for Punky. And I felt better with our three yappy dogs in the room with me, even if they were all the size of the New York City sewer rats. I opened the door just a little bit, and standing on our porch is the sketchiest man that I think I've ever seen. I can still picture him perfectly too. He was really thin, taller man, with dark hair and a sunken face, bags under his eyes and his half-manged hair. Sort of like he just gave it a quick brush and then figured it was good enough. Everything about him seemed just a little too thin as well. A little too shallow and his clothes were all off too. They were nice, I guess, but fake nice, you know? Like a clean, newer-looking t-shirt and new jeans, but he had what looked like a suit jacket on or something. 
All his clothes were dark too, despite the fact that it was summer in Texas and the weather was definitely into the hundreds that day. He also had this plain, unlabeled bottle in his hand. It looked like the label had been covered up or taped over maybe. In any case, I stare up at him in confusion because I definitely don't know this man and I ask what he wants. He smiles at me in this way that was just way too fake. Like this exaggerated and really forced grin and he spoke in the same voice retail workers do. Like, hey there kiddo, I'm trying to sell this here carpet cleaner. And he shakes the bottle at me. Mind if I come to show you how good it works? Alarms are going off in my head obviously because he just seems so... off. Looking back with an adult perspective, the fact that he didn't ask if my parents were home is really unnerving because he probably knew that they weren't and that's why he was here in the first place. I should have told him to get off our property, I know that. That I'd have to go and get my mum, something like that, except for what I did say. Instead, I just shook my head and said, no, we don't have carpet. Well, it works on other things. And he took a big step towards the door and shook the bottle at me. I start to freak out at this point and I think to close the door, but the thing is is that our front door didn't really, well, lock. It was a small town, hard to access home. We never really needed a lock, to be honest. So that was basically useless. And I'm sure that there's something very wrong about to happen. And I'm terrified as I think about what to do in the few seconds I think that I have before it does happen. When all of a sudden, I hear it. Punky had crept up from the hallway, lowered towards the ground, and her teeth bared and snarling like she was absolutely feral. She had slobber just dripping from her mouth, her eyes were down, and she was ready to pounce. The guy, he hears it too, and as I look towards Punky, she tries to lunge past me and I just barely catch her with my leg as she tries her hardest to duck past me and attack this guy. He freaks out and runs off the porch without another word. He booked it down the driveway as I let Pinky out along with the rest of our dogs and they start chasing this guy. Our small dogs, they chase him down the driveway and stop about halfway, barking and jumping about. But Punky, uh, Punky stops just on the porch and watches him with her ears perked, just sort of staring in the distance until... He finally disappears. To this day, I swear that I saw someone join up with him running when he got onto the road. The second that he disappeared, Punky's entire body language changed and she went back to being the sweet dog that I knew. No barking or growling, just laying around, mouth and throat covered in slobber still. I realize that my siblings are still down and call to run to check on them and when I get to the bedroom, my siblings were sleeping soundly still. But it was then that I noticed that the bedroom window was wide open, the curtains pushed all to one side, and the items on the dresser in the front of the window all shoved around. Someone had definitely been trying to climb through the window, no doubt in my mind about it. From what I can gather, the bedroom window was visible from the couch where Punky was sleeping, so I think someone was trying to climb through the window before Punky went after them and scared them off. Then the man at the door was meant to distract me. They definitely didn't expect Punky, a bigger dog, because most of the time she was with my mum inside while our dogs were the ones that saw public eye more often. I don't know what they intended to do, obviously, but... After my mum got home, she took us all to my aunt's house and on our way, we saw the men walking up somebody else's driveway. Men, plural as well. We watched a second one split off to wait by the road. This happened to me when I was about 10 years old, but even now as an adult in my 30s, I remember it like it was yesterday. My parents had taken my sister and I out to a, a movie and then to get some ice cream in celebration of my older sister getting straight A's on her report card. I remember my dad had gotten off work later than usual so by the time the movie was over and we had our ice cream it was well past our bedtime. It didn't matter though. My parents were happy and proud of my sister. 
we had a great time and we took our time getting home as well. If it wasn't for what happened when we got there, I would have always looked back fondly on this night. We got home at around 10.30. Bedtime was usually 10, so I went straight to my mum to put my pyjamas on while my sister went to brush her teeth. I remember too thinking that it seemed a little bit more chilly in the house that night, but that's really the only thing out of the ordinary that I can recall from when we first walked in. I barely had a chance to change too when I heard my dad yell our names from what I thought was the kitchen. I didn't know what was wrong, but I knew that it was bad because I heard the fear in his voice for the first time ever. It scared me really badly, so I bolted out the door and into the kitchen as fast as I could. My sister was already there and her and my parents were standing very close. My mum looked like she was on the verge of panic and she motioned for me to come close. She wrapped her arms around my sister and I and my dad was already dialing on the house phone. Then I noticed some glass on the floor. I asked what was wrong mum but she didn't want to tell me. She said that we needed to go outside right away. As we headed out the front door I heard my dad talking to 911, an operator, and telling them that when we got home we found our backsliding glass door shattered and objects strewn throughout the kitchen. We went to the neighbor's house and waited for the police to come. After a few minutes, my dad joined us. He seemed to be well shaken up, which was a new sight to me, to be honest. But the police arrived and searched the house extensively. It was a big scene with all of our neighbors outside, flashing lights illuminating our entire street for like hours. They never found anybody in the house. Whoever had been there had come and gone. But the thing that really gets me is that nothing was ever stolen. Whoever it was didn't want any of our possessions. What they did was take our canned food out of the pantry and stack them into like small pyramids in our kitchen counter. They also turned on the TV in the basement and moved a few random objects to different parts of the house. Which was really creepy looking back on it. It was like an insane person had been in our home and did things for reasons that really only made sense to him. Anyway... As the police were finishing up and ready to leave, I heard one of them ask my mum a question. They talked quietly and I'm sure that they thought that I didn't hear it. I pretended not to be listening but I heard everything. Well, you see, we keep magnetized letters on our fridge. I think I had gotten them for a birthday present a few years before or something. And we use them to leave each other messages for fun sometimes. The cop was asking my mum if the message on there that night was done by any of us, and it wasn't. And I watched my mum turn pale when he told her what it said. It still makes my skin crawl to this very day, because it said, always watching. The police, they never did find any fingerprints. They said the intruder must have been wearing gloves. And for the next few days, the entire family was extremely uneasy. I was absolutely positive that the intruder was still in the house somehow, that there was a hidden place nobody knew about where he could hide and listen to us. I never really shook the feeling that somebody was there, and within a few months we ended up deciding to move. It was all just too scary for us to stay in that area, so we moved to a house several miles away. Thankfully, we were never bothered again, but I still do think about it. Was it kids just playing a prank? Was it some insane person that wanted to torment a random family? Or was it someone that truly had it out for us and who really was always watching? Could it have been a neighbor or someone that we knew? These questions still keep me up at night sometimes. This obviously happened many years ago, but the hairs on my neck stand up sometimes when I'm alone at home and I have to check the house to make sure that no one is hiding in it. It must have been about 4.45 in the afternoon. My aunt was home alone since my parents were at work and I was on my way home. She heard a knock at the door and went to answer it when the dogs continued barking, meaning that it wasn't a quick delivery or something like that. And she was met with three Caucasian young adult men. They were all wearing black matching uniforms. 
Though, we don't know if there were actually uniforms on it, I guess. They came in a white van with blue letters on it. English isn't her first language, so it was hard for her to understand what they were saying because they talked too fast for her. But she did understand when they asked for me by name. She told them that I wasn't and they immediately left. They didn't leave a message for me or a note or a business card or anything. When I got home shortly after, she told me that some people had been looking for me. They weren't family, obviously, or she would have known them and they weren't friends of mine. They don't sound like any religious group I've ever heard of before or they didn't go to our neighbor's houses or anything too. They came to our house specifically and they knew me by my first name as well. I'm worried about them coming back again and my aunt doesn't live with us. Usually I would be the one home alone at that hour and I'm curious as to who they were and what they wanted with me. But I'm also scared to think of how it would have gone if I had actually opened the door instead. I've dealt with the paranormal side ever since I can remember. But this, this is the story that happened in Mount Juliet, Tien. My wife and I moved in sometime in September of 2014. We bought the home at auction and it needed a lot of work. The home was built in 1969 and it was all original to that date, even down to the shag carpet still being there. The house sat on 12 acres though, with only 3 acres cleared around the home, other than some random trees, but the rest was fully wooded. The basement? Man, the basement was gross and musty. The ceilings were low in places, with the pipes and duct working running throughout it. And I have to admit that it had a, a really odd sort of strange feeling when walking down there. The previous owners left a deep freezer down there, and what they had inside of it made me question the things that they were doing in that basement. The freezer was full of different animal carcasses that had been stripped of meat, random bone pieces with bits of fur still attached. There was also a gallon bucket sitting in there full of blood. Our very first night staying there, my brother and sister decided to stay over with us. But we're all hanging out anyway and it got late so they just decided to stay. And while we were there, we were unpacking boxes and decorating for Halloween and whatnot. I started walking the empty boxes and totes down to the basement. And while down there, something caught my eye. I saw what looked like a slim box sitting on top of the ductwork. I walked over and pulled the box down and sure enough it was an old 70s Ouija board. Not thinking too much about it, I, I grabbed it and brought it upstairs and sat it on our dining room hutch for decoration. The night was getting late though and we are all getting tired. It had to have been around midnight and we decided to head up to the second floor and get some sleep. All the bedrooms were dispersed on the second floor. My wife and I took the master bedroom and my brother and sister took rooms of their own. We laid there trying to doze off when suddenly we heard what sounded like closet doors sliding and slamming shut and the sound of running and stomping back and forth in the hallway. My wife had me get up to tell my brother and sister to stop that before we were trying to get to sleep. I get up and go to each of their rooms and ask, what are you guys doing? We're trying to sleep and... In their words, they said, I thought that that was you guys. I decided to grab my gun at this point, thinking that maybe someone had broken into the house or something. I slowly walked downstairs, clearing each room as I went along. My wife, brother and sister followed behind with a gun of their own. We cleared every room that there was in that house. And suddenly it dawned on my sister, it's the Ouija board. I quickly grabbed it from the hutch cabinet and took it back to the basement and after that it was silent for the rest of the night. Now as time went on whatever this thing was it was making itself known. We would have to block the basement door shut because we were constantly finding it open. Anytime we had to go down into the basement we would always feel something down there and it was demonic for a, a lack of a better term. 
We would hear it walking up to the second floor, walking around the bedrooms. Doors would suddenly slam shut. The lights would surge randomly. I began seeing a dark shadow figure and it wasn't just any well, spirit. Whatever it was, it was completely dark. Like I said, it felt demonic. I felt like I was losing my mind at one point too. Voices were constantly in my head. Sometimes there were whispers, other times they were louder but always sounded sort of muffled. I couldn't ever make out what they were saying but it was all the time and the only time the voices weren't in my head was when I wasn't really home. We also had chickens and sheep that died for no reason. All of our vehicles constantly had problems, including my mower. And one day, as I was putting laundry away, I had the windows open to catch a summer breeze because our HVAC didn't work very well and I heard the strangest sound. So I looked out the window and listened and it was coming from the right side of the house, inside the woods. It got closer and closer and that was when I saw it. This thing is the only way that I can describe it was like a werewolf of sorts but walking throughout our front yard and disappeared into the woods on the other side. I was really just in shock seeing it. I really didn't know what to make of it but it looked like a, a humanoid wolf is the only way that I can describe it. Just walking across the field out there. One random night too we were watching a movie and the lights surged and we heard the basement door slowly opening. I jumped up and wedged the door shut with a chair like I always do. Another night, I walked past the basement door to find it open, no lights on. And I hear my wife down there calling my name. I thought that it was strange that she was down there, so I didn't walk down there. I then heard walking above me. I slowly walk upstairs to the second floor. I make my way up the stairs and turn the corner to find my wife in our room. I told her how I heard her voice calling my name from the basement and to this day I wonder what did I actually hear and if it wasn't my wife then what did it want me down in the basement for? The presence continued and it was making us feel on edge. Tired because I was hardly sleeping now I tossed and turned and the voices grew louder and louder yet I could never really make out what they were saying. After a few years, we decided that enough was enough and we put the house up for sale. But my father-in-law was over helping work on a few things before the house hit the market and while he was there, doors slammed shut and the voices started to enter his mind apparently as well. He even said that he could make out what they were saying and eventually we moved out and after that, there was just nothing. So around July or August of 2021, my city was under its second major lockdown where you were not allowed to have any guests over at your house and stuff like that. I had just moved back in with my parents in early July after my lease ended and I didn't renew it. I'm in my mid-twenties, my mother was a big stickler for the COVID laws, so my girlfriend was not even allowed on my big front porch. <laughs> it was really annoying. But anyway, the girlfriend and I would often go for walks around a local creek near my house. And we were a fresh couple, so we had certain, well, let's say, needs if you catch my drift. There was a hidden side path attached to the main walkway that goes through the creek that we would sneak off into to relieve ourselves. Yeah, I know, it's a bit messed up, but one night at about 7pm, it's winter time, so it's pitch black in this creek after about 5.30. We decided to walk to our spot, and my girlfriend was excited and decided to skip ahead of me. I was walking slowly while she was about 7 meters ahead. Once I turned the corner into the side area, I noticed that she was on her phone and she was acting, well, weird. Checking the weather and other apps and randomly said... Okay, it's time for me to go home now. I was just sort of like, oh, okay. She doesn't want to do it anymore, I guess. No worries. But as we started walking away, she whispers, 
there's someone right behind you. And I'm like, what? So I turn my head over my right shoulder and sure enough, that was a man in all black with his hoodie on, squatting and hiding in the bushes, just sort of staring at us. Where this bush is was on the top of a ledge about uh, three or four feet above the path, so while the man in black was squatting or crouching, our faces were basically aligned. I immediately said, what the heck? I was pretty caught off guard, so I said it weakly, and this man just didn't react at all. He didn't gasp, say hello, or excuse me, or any of the usual things a person would say if people notice each other like that in the pitch black woods of all places. He just stared at us as we slowly walked away. I asked my girlfriend how she even noticed him and she said that when she walked down the trail before I got there, she saw the man on his phone and as soon as she arrived, the man in the hoodie turned his phone off. We left that walkway and went up one sort of close by. Yeah, we're idiots, I know. And as we're walking up the parallel side trail, we could see the man still hiding in the bushes, staring at us. And there was only a faint light from the moon that night, but you could definitely still see him. It was a, a really creepy and unexplained event. But we never really went back there and we never intend to either. About seven years ago, during the time that I was in college, I was around 20 years old. I was highly stressed being a, a biology major. I'd fallen asleep with my office chair facing me. My desk light was still on. And at some point I woke up during the sleep and I was having sleep paralysis, unable to move my body. And what I saw sitting on my chair was the most vivid, detailed and scary creature that I have ever seen in my life. I still remember it to this day. The light was still shining in the background. The creature was about three to four feet tall. It looked like an emaciated old woman, fragile, gray pale skin and very thin as well. The nose was narrow, sharp and big. The eyes were black and dark. But there were no whites around the eyes. The hair was very brittle, thin and gray. The hands were old thin bony long fingers and the nails were so long I would say about one to one and a half inches in length the nails on the foot and hands were not trimmed as if they hadn't been cut her ears were pointy and sharp it looked sort of like an elf I guess but she had a really small chin she wore an old ragged white dress with cut out small triangular patterns during the sleep paralysis I stared at it for a good two minutes or so she stared back at me. She didn't go on my chest or anything as is typical of this sort of thing. And I didn't feel suffocated during the experience. I couldn't scream or move and the thing never smiled or had any facial expressions. It was just completely blank and staring at me. What really freaked me out after the sleep paralysis experience though was that I searched up old hag and found that other people have had similar experiences with the old hag. It was a really crazy sleep paralysis experience. I've never had an experience like this again and I never placed an office chair facing me. I felt like it was an invitation to watch me. It was wicked and it gives me goosebumps when I think about it. Especially because when I woke up, I could have sworn that the chair had moved. My parents, they introduced me to a murderer. Well, a man capable of murder anyway, and we just didn't know it yet. He was a down-to-earth stoner, with three kids and another on the way, with a super sweet wife who was a, a little bit crazy, I guess. He came over, would tell my parents everything going on in his life, then disappear for a few days. He always came back with some crazy stories, but... Never would assume anything bad about him from them. He'd tell us how his wife stabbed him in the foot at one point, how the kids dug a hole in their trailer, that his mother-in-law was psycho and 
once he came over on the run for having a gun at his mother-in-law's. He was there and gone in like five minutes. I regularly check our state circuit court and the dude was never in legal trouble when I looked him up, so I assumed that he just had family issues and maybe a couple of screws loose. But the last time that I saw him, he came over and smoked with my mum and my girl, told us how excited he was for this baby in the way and, and hoped that he looked more like him than the last one who was a clone of his mama. We all hung out together outside and drove the kids around in the ATV, just messing about, about our pasts and our futures and whatnot. He was hopeful. Not a bone in his body said aggressive. He was very empathic, very family orientated, and just really kind all around, I guess. But then, then he went missing for two weeks. And not a peep from him or his wife. But we then see his picture on the news with... The title, Murderer, takes his own life with his name attached. He apparently killed someone, took his body and dumped it. And when the police tried talking to him while he was in his car, he turned, looked at the police and, well, ended his own life. I'm really confused and will never really hear the full story, I guess. Two dead men, no closure for anyone. But because of this man, I think that I'll forever wonder who else I know that is capable of murder. So before I start this, I just want to say that we are that couple in a horror movie. My boyfriend and I, we've been together for a year now and we've recently found out that I was pregnant with our first baby. After we found out, we decided that we needed to get our lives together and buy our first house and move in together. After a few months of searching for our perfect home, we found one in the market, in our price range, just begging for us to buy it, with the previous owners keen to sell it to us as soon as possible. Now, growing up, I've always been aware of spirits and stuff, not seeing them or anything, but I would feel things and hear typical things when things were quiet. It was common for me growing up. My boyfriend is the same, but he often saw them while growing up and has always been scared of his gift, so he tries to block it out most of the time. After moving in, I started to feel a, a presence, I guess you could say, often while I was home alone, especially in the mornings or late at night. It's not a, a nice presence. I would always get the feeling of absolute dread. I would get too scared to move, or my muscles would go tight, and... I feel like I might have had a panic attack at one stage, but as fast as it's brought on, it also leaves that quickly as well, leaving me a little bit shaken. I mostly get this feeling down one end of the house that I don't really go down very often, or in the baby's room in the walk-in robe, which I can't go in without turning the light on straight away. My boyfriend has also said in the mornings when he comes home alone, I leave for work at 5 in the morning and he doesn't leave until 7, that he would get the feeling that he's just not alone and often rushes out the door due to a, a feeling of uneasiness. Only recently have we both really confided in each other about the scary feelings that we get while home alone, and I feel since we've been talking about our experiences, the more frequent they're becoming. Like the other night, I woke up at around 1.30 in the morning, which I now do frequently, but has only become a thing since moving into this house. I lay there for a bit and listened to my boyfriend grinding his teeth, wishing that he'd be quiet when the feeling of dread just hit me so unexpectedly and sudden that I couldn't move. I felt my heartbeat racing in my chest. I went freezing cold and I was too scared to even open my eyes. I could have sworn too that... Someone was pacing around the bed, walking from my boyfriend's side to my side, and then back again. Eventually, after what felt like hours, but it was probably only minutes, it stopped at the end of the bed. I know, cliche horror stuff. I eventually got the courage, though, to open my eyes, and again, I could have sworn that I saw the silhouette of someone at the end of the bed. I immediately picked up my phone, switched the torch on, and... You already know how this ends, right? Nothing was there. So I left my torch on for a bit and cuddled into my boyfriend, who was still asleep, to calm myself down a bit and 
Then I turned the light off and went back to sleep. No dramas. Got up at 5am and headed to work. But after I left my boyfriend that morning, he told me that he had a horrible nightmare that was set in the house and someone was trying to drown him. When he woke up, he felt like someone was pulling on his legs and when he kicked out, he felt like he'd actually kick someone. He quickly sat up and again, nobody was there. He said that he's never gotten ready for work quicker in his life and he was also an hour early. So yeah, but we are that couple in a horror movie at the moment that bought a haunted house. We're currently looking into cleansing our home to get rid of whatever this is. But we are straight up not having a good time and if anyone has any suggestions on how to remove something like this, that would be great. I've been thinking about uh, a weird thing that happened in my life some years ago. I felt like sharing it and I mean maybe somebody else has experienced something like this or can explain it to me. I'll start by saying that uh, I'm really not a believer in the paranormal. I am a Christian but uh, I hardly believe in the demonic or angelic experiences. They're rare if anything. I feel that they're far too rare for average people to experience and can be explained away by science majority of the time. Anyway, this happened probably about six years ago now. I'm 23 and I believe this happened when I was around 16 or 17. I lived with my mother, an abusive stepfather, my younger sister and my baby brother. I lived in the basement of the house just to get away from everything. It was really my only escape. It muffled the arguing and the fighting, that sort of thing, so it's where I opted to stay for most of the time. For anyone curious, my parents are affluent, or in other words, rich, and my stepfather had an influence in the community. CPS didn't care and the cops didn't care. Many times we called the cops and many times CPS were called. Teachers and counsellors and doctors were told, but nothing was ever really done about it. So it just got to the point where we stopped reporting anything and just lived in our own hell. One night though, after hours and hours of fighting and screaming and banging, I don't even know what was exactly happening, neither of my siblings knew either. We are all the avoidant types. If we can stay out of the fight to avoid being hurt ourselves, and we did. But the house just suddenly went silent. It was a relief at first, I mean, I could finally go to bed, right? It was well after midnight at this point and I had school to attend to in a few hours. As I was drifting off to sleep, that was when I heard a blood-curdling scream from my mum. It was so loud from the upstairs of the house that I could hear it at the basement. I immediately ran out of the room. I thought that she was being murdered or something. My one dog was throwing herself down the basement steps to get away as I was running the opposite direction up the stairs. I've never really run so fast to get upstairs before, running through the kitchen and living room to get up to her as well. Me and my siblings met each other outside of her bedroom door to hear her vomiting profusely in the master bedroom. I broke down the door to the bathroom and saw her over the toilet throwing up everything that she had. I asked her what was wrong and she just refused to answer me. I noticed my stepfather was nowhere to be seen. My sister told me that he had left the house and drove off. My brother was crying at this point and my sister was shaking. Really, I didn't know what to do. So I just kept asking her what she needed, but she wouldn't even talk to me. She would just throw up and sit staring into the toilet. Eventually, my brother ran crying into my mum's bedroom and climbed into her bed. My other dog already in bed too, so he climbed on top of her and hugged her. My mum got up and walked past me into the bedroom after him. All the lights were off in her room, so... As she walked, she turned them all on. I followed after my mother while my sister said that she was exhausted but stood in the doorway and didn't move to go anywhere, just sort of watching us. I went to ask my mother for the hundredth time what the heck was going on when she cut me off and said that she saw something evil. I joked and said, was it? And my stepdad's name. She got mad and told me to just shut up and listen. My mother pointed up at the skylight into the ceiling. It was bright and I could see the moon and the clouds. And she said that she saw a pitch black figure crawl across the ceiling. 
I didn't believe her. I told her that it must just be her imagination. She was still running on adrenaline and that she was just upset and needed to go to bed. She screamed at me at this point, furious, saying that her imagination would never run so wild that she'd find herself throwing up over it. I told her that her stomach was probably just upset anyhow and that's why she threw up. She told me that she didn't care what I thought, so I just said, okay, well, I'm going off to bed myself, good night, that sort of thing, and turned off the lights for her. She was in bed with my brother, so I didn't see a reason on leaving them on when I was leaving the room anyway. But when I did, she shrieked at me to turn the lights back on. So I did. Stunned, I turned around and I asked why. She was quiet before telling me that she didn't want to sleep in the dark. I don't know why this upset me, but I got mad and argumentative with her. That she didn't see anything, that is. That she was fine and everybody just needed to go to sleep. I turned off the lights and shined my phone's flashlight up at the skylight and showed her nothing was there. Everything was fine. I turned to her while I was still holding the light up to gesture to her that she was just being irrational. And my sister in the hallway, and she screamed, pointing and wailing at the skylight. I looked up and I still saw nothing. I told my sister to be quiet that she was making things worse and she started yelling back at me that something was there. Something was on top of the skylight, but now it was gone. My mum then told my sister to get into bed with her, so she did. All three of them sat in the bed together, huddled up. I stood there staring, just confused. What were they all seeing that I couldn't? Then my brother screamed. The curtain that was covering the windows across them flew back, and at that I turned around. But once again, there was nothing. While it was odd that the curtains were flung open, nothing was out on the deck. Nothing was outside at all. But he was adamant that something was out there. I was even more angry at this point. I told them to stop acting so crazy, that there are far worse real things going on right now, and while everyone is screaming demon, my mother's husband could come back at any moment and make things actually scary. My mother told me to turn the lights back on and to get the heck out of her room, so I did. I slammed a door behind me and I went downstairs. I do remember vividly checking out the front door's windows to make sure my sister was right, that my stepfather was really gone and sure enough his truck wasn't there. I was angry and tired so in the end I just went back down to my room and tried to get some sleep. When I got down there my 200 pound English Mastiff was in my bed hiding her head in my pillows. I walked up to her and rubbed her back and at that point, she turned back and snapped her teeth at me. I was shocked. I mean, this was not like her behavior towards me at all. Like, ever. I was mad, though, and told her to get down, and so she did. She got out of the bed and laid down beside it. I hopped into bed, and I went to go back to sleep. But that was when I felt it. I felt, and I know for sure, two pairs of hands gliding across my back at the exact same time that my dog started barking furiously. I jumped out of bed, turned on all the lights, but when I did, there was nothing. Nothing was there. I opened the curtains and looked outside, but still, nothing. I remember at this point shaking so bad, and my dog just kept growling in my general direction. And I mean, what do you do in that situation other than just run? So I grabbed my dog's collar and pulled us both out of my room. I ran upstairs with her following after me. I turned on every light as I ran. I ran through the kitchen, the dining room, and the living room all over again and kept turning on the lights as I went. I got upstairs to my mum's room. All the lights were still on and her door was closed, but I opened it and went in, my dog following after me. I didn't say anything. I climbed into bed with them and my dog jumped up after me. All four of us slept in her queen-size bed with our two dogs that night. I didn't sleep though. My mum called us all out of school the next morning. My stepfather didn't come home until days later. And I've never had a paranormal experience since then. The problems, they continued. And to be honest, I, I don't know what to think of this all these years later. I've told people this story a few times and every time 
no one has any sort of explanation for me. I'm not sure if anyone has a good way to explain what happened or maybe ease my mind or if you even had a similar experience growing up in an abusive home or something. I don't know, but that's, that's my terrible story. To ease your minds about my situation and my sibling situations, my sister and brother still live with my mother and stepfather, well, I no longer do. I moved out three years ago. But oddly enough, my mother's husband has mellowed out in his old age. Both my siblings have said that he no longer fights like he used to. He's just petty and toxic, but not physically abusive like he used to be. He's not a good person to live with, but he's no longer targeting anyone, which is good. He just works long hours and doesn't come home until late. And my mum works long hours and works opposite schedules with him, so they rarely see each other. It's not a fun situation by any means, but at least everyone's safe, right? Well, at least according to them. If you made it this far, then thanks for listening. I'm going to try not to think about this situation too much now, but anyway, if you've got any information or if you know anything about this, then I would love to hear it. A few years back, my family and I went to stay at a beach house in Clearwater, Florida. The house is rented indefinitely by my husband's rich uncle. It's three stories with two master bedrooms on the middle floor and two bedrooms on the top floor. My husband's parents stayed in a master on the middle floor and my husband and I stayed upstairs to be next to our four-year-old daughter. Now, the morning after our first night there, my mother-in-law asked, did you guys hear someone banging on the door at like 3 a.m.? Well, we didn't. She described it as being very loud and continued for some time. I thought that it was strange that she heard that and just stayed in bed and didn't wake anyone else or check it or anything. You have to walk up a large wooden staircase to get up to the front door. And I mean, why would someone be at our door at like 3 in the morning? What if they needed help? Personally, it would have scared me, I think, but she was from a different generation, so whatever, I guess. I didn't think about this conversation for a long time again, in fact. It was a while before I remembered that it took place and realized that it was actually relevant to what I experienced. You see, at some point in my trip, my husband and my mother-in-law decided to rent bikes and go for a ride. My father-in-law took my daughter outside to play on the beach and I had the house to myself. My plan was to sit on the couch in the living room and just relax and read a book. It was a beautiful room with floor-to-ceiling windows to view the ocean However, the wall to my left was a wall of doors, a closet, a laundry room, and a bathroom. I hadn't been reading my book long when I heard like a, a thud three times from the direction of the doors. You know the sound that it makes when you hit a hollow door? It's different from hitting something solid and doors tend to have some wiggle room in the frame so you can hear it shake just a bit. Well, I didn't think too much about it. I mean, houses make really weird noises sometimes, right? Maybe it was the dryer, maybe a mouse or something, no big deal. But it happened again and still no big deal. I returned to my book. But it kept happening. The thuds were sort of frantic. There was no real pattern or measurable distance of time between the thuds. And so finally, I decided to get up. I was a little bit scared, so I stared towards the doors Eventually, I was so scared that I moved to the sliding door that led to the balcony and beach access. I really didn't know what to think. I mean, what could possibly be hitting the door that much? At this point, it wasn't just a fluke. I didn't think it was an animal either. It wasn't the dryer, so what if someone was actually in there? I called my father-in-law and told him that I'm scared and need him to come and check it. He packed up my daughter and came back to find me on the balcony, too afraid to go back inside. I explained what was happening. He went inside to check things out, and of course the banging had stopped as soon as he arrived, so he didn't experience it. He checked all three rooms and found nothing that could have caused the noise, and in the end there just was no explanation. The rest of the trip went smoothly and nobody reported any strange noises after that. I didn't spend any time alone in the house after that though, so I really don't know what those noises were. I am interested in the paranormal, but I don't really believe anything, I guess. 
I have to experience it myself, and even then, it has to be completely undeniable. But this wasn't undeniable for me by any means. Part of me still thinks that there must have been some sort of an explanation. It's really the only weird and unexplained story that I have in my life, and as I've thought about it, I don't know, it just seems like something was really off. My mum passed away three weeks ago, and I don't know, I guess I find myself revisiting the memory because I so wish to believe that there's something beyond this. My friend likes to go mushroom foraging, and one time she brought me with her. We got further and further into the woods, getting distracted by cool rocks or different mushrooms, or even just by talking. We were having a great time, just the two of us, until we stumbled into a clearing where there was a, a man sitting, skinning what looked like a deer. I was sort of froze for a second. I mean, I only moved to this yee town about a year and a half ago. I'm from the Bronx, where you can see some weird stuff, but I'm definitely not used to the hunting culture, I guess. But my friend and I were just sort of frozen, though. The man looked up, covered in blood, and said, You know it's not safe for girls like you out here, right? Then, he let out a really raspy laugh, instantly chilling my bones. He picked up his frighteningly large knife and just kept skinning the deer and muttering about all the dangerous animals in these woods. My friend and I were just nodding, not sure what else to say or do really. He looked back up at us and said, There's the bears, sure, the mountain lions, the fisher cats and the rabbit coons, but the most dangerous thing out here? He leaned forward and pointed the knife. Man, the most dangerous game there is. My friend and I, we made eye contact and just, well, booked it, running through the woods, through the bushes and thorns, and eventually we found our way back to her property. We're obviously not sure if creepy hunter guy was just scaring us for giggles, but, I mean, man, it was creepy. I'd like to think that he just got a, a bit of a kick out of scaring two teenagers, but holy smokes... I was not in the mood for this dude to pull a, a Robert Hansen on us, so we got out of there, quick smart. The story that I'm about to share happened to my brother, sister, and myself back in the early 90s. I've decided to share this story because of, well, a recent family tragedy, and it brought this experience to mind. I've been thinking about it a lot, so I've decided to share it. When I was a child, I grew up in a haunted house. I've had many terrifying experiences, odd things happening, but this, this is the one that tops the cake. I was 10 years old at the time, my two older sisters, 12 and 14. We had a foreign exchange student named Amy from Germany staying with us for two weeks at the time. She was very odd and quirky, but I sort of began to enjoy her personality. I should also add too that, and this will be important, we had a dog named Cookie. He was a Shih Tzu Yorkie mix, and due to his size, he could never jump up on a couch. He would try and try until you'd finally have to pick him up and put him up on there yourself or on a chair, etc. I'd never seen him be able to jump up on our couch, but this particular day, my parents both had to go into work at the same time and ask my older sister to watch us kids for the afternoon. We were playing and goofing around for a while. Amy started to go through our parents' junk closet to see if there would be something to play with, when she all of a sudden came out of the closet ecstatic holding a tape recorder. She starts wanting to record funny things and then listen to it back. It sounded fun. And we were all having a good time making farting noises or burping, stupid stuff that kids think is funny. When all of a sudden, Amy looks at us and says, let's make scary noises in the recorder. I was a little nervous since I knew that we had scary things in our home, but eh, I went with it. As we're making these recordings, out of nowhere, Amy stood up straight and stared down the main hallway and looked directly into my room. I began to notice that she looked pale, so pale that it made me think that she sort of looked a little bit like a ghost. 
We were all sort of drawn and staring at her in confusion. But all of a sudden, she brought up her right hand and covered her right eye. She put her hand down after a few seconds and then brought up her left hand, covered her left eye, and it was sort of as if she didn't believe what she was seeing or something. But it was at that point that I instantly felt the energy in the home become really thick, almost like the air got sucked out of it or something, like a vacuum. This all happened in maybe 30 seconds, but all of a sudden, Cookie ran towards my bedroom and was barking at the room. Then he whimpered and bolted down the hallway and jumped onto the couch. Right after that moment, we started to hear, like, something run full force down the hall towards us. We couldn't see it, only hear it, but we all jumped on the couch and huddled together sobbing and terrified. But we could hear it running down the hall towards us. As it reached us, we felt this massive wind go through us, and then the running would start over again as if it was a, a repeat cycle. But the energy was overwhelming and terrifying. We could feel it every time that it ran through us as well. I've never felt that level of fear and terror in my entire life, and it's something that I'll never forget. This went on for some time though, and the neighbor to our left, that was a priest, heard us screaming and came over to check out what was happening. And as soon as he touched that doorknob, it instantly stopped. He came into us terrified and sobbing uncontrollably. He called my parents and they came home immediately. We never did hear from Amy again after that and she left three days later. I have always wondered about her though and the trauma she experienced staying with us and that effect. I hope she's okay now after what we went through in our home but anyway that's the story and I'll swear by its truth until the day that I die. Me and my boyfriend, we absolutely adore hiking, and there are so many places to go because of where we live in Oregon. And one day, we decided to go hiking after 11pm at night to one of the most used trails in our area. We have both been there multiple times throughout our lives, and neither of us were concerned about something happening. There was only one thing that we were kind of nervous about, and that was the wildfire that had just happened. We parked on the side of the road and walked to the start of the trail, and even though there was a fire, the path was actually very clean and stable. So we started walking up the trail when we just started talking about paranormal things like witchcraft and wendigos and stuff like that. Terrible move on our side, talking about things of that sort when you're hiking at night. But anyway, it should be noted that we both had flashlights, very good ones too, and we were both very observant as to where we were on the path. Like I said, we know this place too. As we got deeper into the conversation, we both realized in just a second that we were now all of a sudden not on a trail anymore or anywhere near one. I mean, it was like instantly in a blink of an eye. All of a sudden, I remember walking on the trail and then we just weren't. I freaked out and told him that we needed to start backtracking, but... Thankfully, he said no because we couldn't see any trail around us or anything that we recognized. And I truly believe that if we had tried backtracking, I don't think that I would be writing this. He told me that we needed to start walking up the hill in hopes of either standing on a ledge to see where we were or to find another path. We walked for a while up the hill and thankfully we popped out on a fire road. We walked all the way down terrified and came out on the road about a mile from where our car was. There's just no way that we should have been where we were. Anyway, we eventually made it back, but I just wanted to share this experience because it was weird and I still have no explanation for it. If anyone has any opinion, then please do let me know because this one has me stumped. This happened about six years ago in 2016. I was 18 at the time, had moved back to Portland, Oregon for college as an escape from the eight-year-old hellhole that was my life in San Diego, California. 
I grew up with a single mum most of my life, so I moved around a lot. I'd lived in Vancouver, Washington, the greater Portland area, for a few years prior to moving to San Diego. So when I needed an escape to leave SoCal, as soon as I graduated, going to college out of state was really the only option. I applied to Portland State University two weeks prior to the submission deadline, and I of course got in. I arrived to Portland a good six weeks prior to school starting since I had some academic programs that I got in that required an earlier presence to establish some ground before school started and all that. So there I was, 18 years old, returning nostalgically to what I called home, living in the Broadway freshman student housing and I took in my sense of freedom by going on late night walks around the, the park blocks to Rocket Fears or Voodoo Donut just about anywhere that I could. Now that I've listened to true crime podcasts, watched a lot of true crime since I was in elementary school, thanks to my ex-sheriff mum who told jail stories for bedtime, I should have known better than to do what I did, I know that. I was notorious among my friends though for the style that I adopted, even in the autumn weather Portland has. I would wear a long XXL shirt, no pants, sneakers, and a clear transparent bag. Yes, where you can clearly see my wallet, and that I also had a weapon everywhere that I went. Even on my 11pm to 4am walks alone, I still wore something like this. This story is about one of those lonesome late night walks too. I found a decent parking garage that I would walk to most nights, near SW 6th and Jefferson in downtown. I would chain smoke into the night, and no issues on any situation, except for this one night. It was about 1am or 2am at this time I would guess. I was heading back to my dorm room, slightly tipsy. I had passed my friends up on a party at University Point that day, so all of my immediate contacts were inebriated at a party not too far from where I was. I found myself walking down 6th Avenue alone. It was eerie too given that it was a Saturday night. There was not a car or a person in sight and I had both headphones in focusing on not feeling coldness and heading home. When suddenly a, a car speeds up to where I am Two men hop out and both go on each side of me. I pause my music and act as if I'm not freaked out. I am visibly intoxicated and probably smell faded too. And let me also mention that at this point in my life, I had shaved my head pretty much bald, was about 135 pounds, and wore large shirts like I said. I could have been a pantless male for all they could have known. But they said, hey, how are you? Where are you headed? You seem a bit drunk. I shoot the guy on my left daggers as much as I can while all the while trying to assure myself that I can still walk straight. I'm just trying to make it home tonight, I say back. The guy on the right says, well, we can help, but we can take you to your home. Where's home at? I ignore him and I keep my pace. I didn't believe in God then, but was praying in my head that I made it home that night, promising whoever I was praying to that I wouldn't be this stupid being out late again, alone, under the influence. Both give each other a look, and they start walking slower, now following behind me. I keep my pace and calculate how far I am, where my resident hall key was, and how fast I could possibly run while making it to the building without being caught by the two men on foot or their accomplices in the car. But before I could mentally provide myself those answers, the car screeches back and they all of a sudden hop in and speed off. I count my lucky stars that this happened while running back. I head to Max, it's a, a liquor store me and the gang used to chain smoke at. I call campus security and relay all the stuff that just happened to them and to my horror, I'm told that I'm the 13th call with such a report that way. I head back inside to my dorm, awaiting my friends to tell them what had just occurred. Oh, but the story doesn't end there. You see, fast forward to July 2017, and I dropped out of college by the first semester. I went back to San Diego for a few months and officially moved me and my family all up to Portland. We were pretty settled in our cozy apartment where we were watching the news one night. 
and my heart sank to my stomach and I felt like I was about to vomit because there on the news a sex trafficking ring in the next city over was busted. Quite a few faces had been shown as to who was arrested but they were mostly women which was interesting with only a handful of men shown but I did recognize two of the faces there the two being the men from that night. Yes, I was tipsy and yes, I was a little bit high, but I knew that those faces were theirs for sure. I called the PPD and I provided them with the information, with them verifying some call-ins around the same time period of mine were how some of the members chose to abduct. Why they didn't abduct me, I'll never know. All I know is that I'm grateful. I'm grateful that they didn't take me. I'm grateful that I ran when I did. And I'm grateful that they were caught. Let me preface this by saying that I work in a well-populated town with a low crime rate and no reason to outright assume any of these actions were what I later found out to be trafficking attempts. So I work at a popular coffee chain, generally doing afternoon closing shifts. This night in particular, we had a very young crew for closing, which happens at 10.30pm. For reference to, we have our shift lead, 19 female, her name is Sarah, myself, 17 female, my co-worker, 17 female, her name is Mia, and another co-worker, 18 and female, her name is Dee. Now, it had been a relatively slow night with only a few loyal regulars dropping by. Both drive through and the cafe were pretty much empty, as heavy rainfall had started and no one wanted to be out. I was in the front of the store cleaning while the rest of my co-workers were in the back of the store when an older man walks in. He wore odd clothing, a bit strange for the humid weather, a full black attire with combat boots, a heavy red jacket and a beanie on his head obscuring his hair. I brushed it off as protection from the storm and figured that he worked outside and went to ask if he had placed an online order as he stood at the mobile counter. Putting on my customer service voice, I smiled and went through my standard spiel but was alarmed when instead of responding, he places a bag on the counter and starts pulling out DVDs. Once he finishes pulling out a stack of 10 or so, he stares past me into the back room where my co-workers were obliviously chatting and then makes a sort of lap around the store, eyeing me the entire time, not speaking a word. He backs out of the front door and walks out to his truck, which I now see is a, a large black pickup. Freaking out now, I stupidly grab the stack of DVDs and run back to my co-workers. They're immediately alarmed by my demeanor and ask me what's wrong. I hold out the DVDs and let them inspect them while I explain what happened. Much to my discomfort, Sarah points out that all of the movies are about either murders or kidnappings. Slightly ticked off by this and extremely uncomfortable, we make the decision to call my manager. He picks up and Sarah explains the situation while I comfort Dee and Mia who are freaked out, probably more so than I am at this time. He tells us that there's nothing that we can do about it but to call back if anything else happens. So we hang up and move back to the front of the store as a group. Things pretty much go on as usual as well, but with an air of fear about us, I guess. Mia sticks to my side and Dee to Sarah's. The man's truck had pulled off at that point, but much to my dismay, had only pulled into the now closed grocery store next door that had a clear view into the drive through window. A few cars pulled through the drive through and I even had a few customers ask if I was alright, due to my, well, what I assumed to be terrified face. I've always had a pretty good intuition about things, and this felt more wrong than anything else I'd ever felt. A bit more time passes though, and it's now time for Dee to leave. With the man still in the parking lot next door, we decided that it would probably be best for her boyfriend, Daniel, to come and pick her up. This wasn't an irregular occurrence too and we didn't want him following her home. Mia then points out that a van had been sitting in the back of the parking lot for almost an hour at that point, which we had not noticed previously. Another gut feeling hits at this point and I make the decision to lock the door. 
Daniel tells her that he's on the way and I inform my manager that we close the cafe for peace of mind, which he was fine with as business was slow anyway. Now, Sarah and Dee are in the back and Mia and I are up front. I go about cleaning the machines and trying to make idle chatter to keep her calm, which is no small feat let me tell you as she jumps every time she hears someone steaming milk. As we're talking and I have my back turned to her, she screams mid-sentence, get out. Alarmed, I whip around to where she is standing near the counter, close to the drive through window, and saw her pointing to a shadowy figure climbing through that window. The next few moments were just a blur of adrenaline-rushed thinking and what I can only explain is extreme divine intervention. It genuinely cannot be explained by anything other than some grand divine plan to keep myself and my co-workers alive. But grabbing her arm, I yank Mia behind me and grab the hot bucket of sanitizer that I had been using to scrub the counters around the machines with. I throw the liquid onto him, simultaneously pushing the man out the window, which he had only had his shoulders through, with a big red bucket now on his head. If you work in food service, you know the ones. Bulky things. At the same time, Daniel pulls up outside. Mia is now yelling for someone to call the police, and I see Dee in my peripheral running outside to our new saviour. I slam the drive through window shut and lock them, with the man still laying on the ground struggling to get his bearings. I couldn't tell you how much time passed, although it couldn't have been more than like 50 to 30 seconds before I see Daniel rush the man who was now on his knees and pin him to the ground. Sarah and Mia were now pulling me to the back of the store, with both fighting back sobs and Sarah on the phone with the police. Thankfully, we have some awesome regulars who are also deputies that arrived within five minutes of our call and arrested the man. The aftermath was messy, but they eventually pinned him as a member of a local trafficking ring that had been caught years prior and let out on bail. Oh yeah, and uh, the van in the back that had kept Dee from leaving in the first place, it hightailed it out of the parking lot in the middle of all the action but was eventually traced back to people who were also a part of that ring. Even though I won't be releasing names or such as legal proceedings are still happening, I figured that I would tell my story here and I still work there and am very grateful for Daniel who very well could have saved all of our lives in that moment. He managed to keep the man pinned the entire time until the police arrived and disarmed him. He really is the true hero of this story although I do pride myself on quick thinking for getting him out of the store. Anyway, moral of the story, trust your gut feelings, and always have a steaming hot bucket of sanitizer on hand. Oh, and uh, the DVDs? I should probably mention their relevance, other than scaring everyone. The police did check them out during the investigation, which is technically ongoing, but found that they were blank. In my terms of terrible explanation, to them it looked like he burned blank DVDs but unsuccessfully, so whatever was supposed to be on them didn't stick allegedly. But they weren't the original DVDs, we never bothered to open them when they were in our hands anyway. But a part of me thinks that the police, they may be lying to me about it to hide the fact that there was something really bad on them. But... I try not to think about all of that too much. So, they lived in Connecticut and it's where I grew up. This happened when I was like 14. It was either right after Ed Warren passed away or not too long after. Me and my dad, we were staying at my aunt's house one night... It was a two-family house, so her and my uncle, as well as my cousin, her husband and their two children, they all lived there. It was a new house they had just built and moved in a couple of months back. I found this part out later, by the way. But leading up to that night, my aunt was having crazy dreams where a little boy would appear in her dreams every night, or so she thought they were dreams, and let her out of bed. My aunt said that the outside of the house was a very bright light that shone through the windows to the point where she couldn't see anything outside and the little boy would try to lead her outside. But my aunt would always be found in the morning by my uncle around the house, passed out on the bathroom floor, the living room, even the garage one time. 
I just assumed that my aunt was sleepwalking. So, anyway, that night at about 2am or so, everyone hears this loud screaming coming from the upstairs living room. Me and my dad and my aunt and uncle all wake up and run upstairs because it sounded like somebody was hurt. We get up there and my cousin and her husband are in the living room and my cousin's son, who was about two years younger than me, was sitting in a rocking chair. His back was to us, but my cousin and husband were freaking out. So my dad and my uncle walked over to my cousin and went to see what was wrong. My uncle touched his shoulder and he turned his head around and it was bright red. His eyes were bloodshot and his skin was starting to turn this weird grayish color. When they tried asking him what was wrong, he started speaking in another language and was rocking in the chair back and forth. Now, he was known as a kind of prankster of a kid. So my uncle and my cousin's husband, thinking that he was playing around, yelled at him to stop and went to grab him out of the chair. But when they touched him that time, he let out a huge scream, again in another language of some sort, and his eyes started to roll in the back of his head. We all started freaking out at this point, not knowing what to do. My cousin went and got a glass of water, thinking that maybe he was sleepwalking and threw it on him. And he just laughed in this really creepy and sort of deeper voice. My aunt was a pretty holy woman. She would keep crosses and angel statues and even holy water in the house. So she ran back downstairs to get the holy water because at this point, we realized something weird was going on. My dad and my uncle grabbed him out of the chair. He was kicking and trying to fight them the whole time and held him on the floor. My aunt brings over the holy water and rubs it in her hands. My cousin lifts up his shirt while he's being held down and my aunt places her hand on his back and it literally burnt him. In fact, it left a burn mark the exact size of her hand on his back. He screamed and screamed for a couple of seconds before he ended up just passing out. I'm just standing there the whole time absolutely terrified, not moving and just watching all of this happen. So he's passed out and not knowing what to do, they call the police. It's probably around 3am at this point. So the police come with the paramedics and talk to us all and the meds check out my second cousin to see if he's okay. He ended up waking up and they said that he was fine, save the still having the burn mark on his back. Not knowing what to do, the police recommended that they give Mrs. Warren a call since she was a famous paranormal investigator and lives right in CT. So, nobody ends up going to bed at all that night and me and my dad leave in the late morning. Now, this next part I wasn't there for, but about a week later my aunt gives Mrs. Warren a call, tells her about what happened and invites her to the house. Apparently, Lorraine knew what the house was about before she even stepped foot in there. Apparently, the newly built house was built on land that housed some kind of a portal to the other dimension or something. I don't know, but the little boy in my aunt's dream was trying to lead my aunt outside through this portal, apparently, because if a human entered the portal, it would be open enough for demons to constantly go through. Apparently one got through and was able to possess my second cousin because he wasn't strong enough to fight it. Well, Lorraine ends up doing this whole seance and cleansing of the house to get rid of it all and close it permanently. And they ended up living in that house for about another eight years without any problems ever again before selling it and moving out of state. I never did stay over there again though and to this day... That night, it still haunts me. So this is another good old story from South Africa. As people from there know too, there's a lot of game farms, lodges, etc. Especially around the area of Kruger National Park. This incident took place in a very tranquil four-star game farm close to the southern tip of the above-mentioned Kruger National Park as well. So, we frequented the lodge often over the five years before this incident as it was a favorite with me and my wife, then girlfriend. The lodge had a very nice central area with pool, restaurant, etc. And then the tents were spread out around with the furthest one about maybe a kilometer from the restaurant. 
The chalets were very private and set up in the bush so you could not see the next one over and could only hear your neighbours if they were really loud. Sadly, the lodge has fallen on hard times and has gone backwards a bit. The weekend this incident took place, only two of the 25 plus units were occupied for the Friday night and we were the only ones there for the Saturday night. It did make me feel a little bit uneasy if I'm being honest. But to make matters worse, the lodge or the farm manager came by on Saturday morning saying that he's leaving the farm for the weekend. If we need anything to just help ourselves in the restaurant fridges, then leave a note and then we can settle the bill next week. Sure, no problem. We have the pool and the jacuzzi all to ourselves. We left to go for a visit to the KNP after the manager left and stayed out most of the day. We got back around 3pm and as we got out of the car I just got goosebumps. It was 35 degrees Celsius out, like over 100 Fahrenheit, so I definitely didn't get cold or anything. As we approached, we parked about 150 meters from the place that we were staying and had a little path that we walked down. And as we approached, I noticed big shoe prints over mine and my girlfriend's prints from this morning. That seriously put me on edge. I approached the place that we were staying and noticed the prince turn around and walk back the way that they came, but everything seemed in order. We went for a swim and a bit of a game drive around the farm and returned at around 5.30, started to make the fire, barbecue the meat and prepare some other food. Both me and my girlfriend seemed on edge though and we were just really quiet. We sat down to eat at around 8pm and as we sat down I looked at my girlfriend. She looked worried. I asked her what was wrong and she said that she was having a bad feeling and that we should go. I said that I felt the same and we need to leave now. Not after we ate but right then. So we chucked our food in the cooler, grabbed our bags and we ran to the car. Jumped in and almost raced out of there. As we went out the gate, we dropped the keys in the box and drove away, and the feeling of dread slowly went away. We made the 150 kilometer, almost 100 mile drive home in the dark and slept in our own bed. We woke up on Sunday and went about our day as normal. At about 4pm that afternoon though, my phone rings and I see it's the number from the lodge manager. I answer and he frantically asks if we're okay and... I say, yeah, of course, why? He starts explaining and my veins go ice cold. Apparently, the lodge was broken into and ransacked this Saturday night. They took everything of value and what they could not take, they destroyed. It was a group of five men that did it. And apparently, there was no evidence that they ransacked any chalets as well. Only one. The one that my girlfriend and I were booked into. The one that we would have been sleeping in had we not left so abruptly the previous night. So that means that they were watching us. The lodge had cameras but the chalet did not and we left just after 8pm, probably about 8.10 when we had everything in the car and started driving. And at about 8.20 when we left the farm, as it was about 2 kilometers from the lodge to the gate down to a gravel road, the cameras caught the first signs of movement at the lodge just before 8.30. And at least one was visibly armed with a firearm in the footage, and a few had machetes. I shudder to think what would have happened had we have been there. The nearest people would have been like over 3 kilometers away in a straight line, and we were completely alone on that farm. There was only a little bit of cell reception to at the lodge and none where we were staying. In other words, there was no way that we would have been able to call for help. Needless to say, we did not go to lodges or isolated areas for a long time after that. And sadly, the lodge and the farm went under not long after this and I saw ads that it was being sold on a bank auction. That incident, it shocked us both quite a bit and we vowed to always trust our instincts and intuition after it and to tell each other if something felt off. We both have had that uneasy feeling since about 3 that afternoon when we came back and 
The reason neither of us said anything was because we didn't want to spoil the weekend for the other. And that almost cost us, possibly, the ultimate price. So, the lesson that we learned here is to trust your gut. Trust your partner's gut feeling too. If something feels off, it's probably because it is. And it may just save your life, like it did for us. So, I would like to start this off with some good news. I am officially COVID free. I still have a sinus infection which caused the fever as well as some other symptoms, but luckily it's fairly easy to treat so I'll be good to go in no time. But now to some bad news. So while the past couple of days were pretty silent, last night was terrible. I had that unsettling feeling for most of the night before we went to bed so I knew something was going to happen. When we were in bed before we went to sleep, my girlfriend joked around that she was possessed by a demon and kept making this really creepy grin, like one where you're smiling ear to ear but your eyes are wide open. I could tell that she was joking, but still, it was a bit creepy. But after that, she told me the ghost in her dream said that I was cheating on her. I'm definitely not. We've been dating for three years and I would never do that to her. So, apparently this ghost is a, a homewrecker. But while that's not necessarily creepy too, just annoying that something like this is going on, things picked up when she went to sleep. It all started with this loud booming sound, sort of like a big truck driving by your window with the rhythmic beat of the engine. At first, that's what I thought it was. The window in our bedroom is right over a street where it's not rare for a big truck to drive by. But this booming just never stopped. There wasn't a single point where this noise was coming from too. No matter where I looked, the volume of the boom just never changed. Throughout the entire night, it never stopped too. Never got louder, never changed rhythm, just kept beating. Normally, I would easily be able to write this off and just fall asleep, but about 30 minutes after my girlfriend fell asleep, she started talking. At first she looked like she was having a pleasant conversation. She held out her hand for what looked like a handshake and started giggling. After that I could hear her bring up my name in the incoherence of her sleep talk so I thought maybe she's talking to me in her dream? No. After a little more of the conversation went on she looked at me with her eyes wide open and said we're talking about you and started giggling and then passed right back out. This creeped me out a lot, reminding me of the first night at the lake house, but after such a spook there was really only one thing that I could do, try to fall asleep into a YouTube rabbit hole. I put my airpods in, I could still hear the booming, but a little more muffled now, and pulled up a video. About another half an hour goes by and my girlfriend is talking again. This conversation seems a little bit more serious though as she's not giggling and her tone changed. After about a minute of talking she sits up in bed and just does about the worst thing that I could imagine. She crawls over to me to my side of the bed, crouches down on the floor, points under the bed, looks directly into my eyes and says there's men moving around under there. After that she got back into bed and fell asleep like nothing happened. I must have been about an inch away from needing to change my pajama pants after that. So I shake her awake and say, what did you mean by that? She looked really confused and said that she had no clue what I was talking about. I said, please tell me you're joking. You don't remember a thing? You just pointed under the bed and said that there was men moving under there. She immediately looks terrified and says, I have no clue what you're talking about. Quit scaring me. It took a bit longer for her to fall asleep after that, and I turned my phone flashlight on for the remainder of the night. And not much happened after that, but there was one other point where she held her hand out for a handshake and mumbled something, but no conversation this time. She left at about 7.30 in the morning, but after saying goodbye, I immediately got back into bed and I just passed out. When I woke up again at around 10.30, I felt this 
completely overwhelming sadness that had me on the verge of tears. Even in that moment when you first wake up and you can't remember a single thing about your day, I still felt that sadness. Now of course, I love and miss my girlfriend with all my heart, but she was only going to be gone for like a couple of days and even when we would take separate trips, neither of us get this world-ending feeling like this. It genuinely felt like the world had gone grey and the only thing that I could do was cry. Luckily, I was able to push through this feeling, give my pets breakfast, and take my dog out to the potty. But not even 30 seconds of being outside, and the feeling was completely gone all of a sudden. Again, I miss my girlfriend a lot, and I still feel that, but not to the point of a mental breakdown. I don't know what's going on, but it seems like activity is picking up again, and... The man moving under the bed definitely seems to miss my girlfriend too. Seeing as they're already trying to break us up and now I'm alone at the apartment with them, uh, I have to admit that it's pretty terrifying. I might go and get some sage to smudge the apartment later today or something. I'll definitely keep all of you guys updated as I'm absolutely terrified and if I get killed by a jealous ghost or something, then at least, well, it'll be documented. It was early spring of 2016. I had just turned 24 years old. My friend and I just reached our main spot to camp, Black Canyon Rim Campgrounds, just outside of Payson, Arizona. We'd usually travel out here uh, two or three times each year, I would say. It has some incredible views and is only a couple of hours away from the city. For the most part, this area was pretty secluded too. A privately owned convenience store rested a few miles away with a small town 20 miles before that. The entrance was a dirt road, directly off the highway, with a campground sign at the start of the road marking local wildlife, many fire hazards and generally news relevant to camping folk. The pathing path is mostly linear, with maybe one fork spanning several miles. We once travelled down the dirt road to see how far it would take us, but one of the paths would take you to another highway entrance, but with a ranger's tower halfway there. The other path led to a, a sort of a dead end. An abandoned cabin can be found on this path too, a few miles in, mostly hidden off in the distance behind some larger foliage. Now, the snow had mostly cleared up at this point, leaving for crisp air, a slight chill and fauna becoming active again. We'd usually spot some wild horses, several deer and tons of little critters whenever we'd come out this way. It really was the perfect time of year for a relaxing trip to get away from the city for a few days. We got in around 4pm on Tuesday. It was late for us as we'd usually try to get out, by noon at least. This trip was pretty spontaneous though. We both had work during the coming weekend and decided to just go for it. The sun was setting fast though and we still hadn't even picked our spot to camp. There were maybe two other groups, both families, parked somewhat close to the entrance, only a few hundred yards away from the highway. This time around, we just wanted to get away from humans for a while. The customer service jobs will do that to you, let me tell you. We drove down the dirt road, past our usual spot, and finally we picked the perfect area, a small clearing just hanging off the edge of a hill. The whole valley could be seen from this area too, with a beautiful sunset. This would have been our main spot from then on too, if the next night's incident never happened that is. We agreed to get a campfire going, and would just avoid building a tent this trip. We didn't have much time to do so anyway, and her car wasn't that uncomfortable. I'd sleep in the back seat, and she'd take the passenger seat. With the windows slightly ajar, we'd have a few blankets for each of us, and would fall asleep into that unrivaled slumber. And the next day went fairly uneventful. We just sort of decompressed. But I had this strange feeling throughout the day, though. Like we were being watched. There were crunching of leaves just out of sight every few hours, but I figured that it was just the local wildlife doing their thing. My friend didn't notice anything unusual too, so I didn't dwell on it. Night came and the feeling just still hadn't gone away though. 
My friend must have felt something she didn't vocalize though because she took some sleeping pills. She didn't usually need to take them on her camping trips. The nature's ambience was enough to put anyone to sleep, I thought. Anyway, it was nearing 1am and my friend dozed off in the passenger seat while I attempted to wind down in the back. I leaned against the side window behind the passenger seat, legs outstretched to the car's back door. The window opposite me was rolled down slightly with a cold breeze flowing in. I'd been on my phone just scrolling through Facebook or whatever when I heard something outside. A few crunches of the fallen leaves, several paces outside the car. I whispered to my friend, Hey, did you hear that? But she was already out. I put my phone down and listened intently for a minute or two, but there was nothing. It must have been a small animal, curious of the camp. I went back to my phone, scrolling through social media. About 10 minutes had passed, I guess, when I heard it again. It was right outside the door, though, this time, and I lowered the phone. My eyes took me a minute to adjust from the light of the phone into the deep dark of the woods. But as I turned my phone away from me, the backlight illuminated the window above my feet. And to this day... I cannot get the image out of my head. Two dirty, scabbed hands held onto the window, the fingers wrapped inside the car. The nails were long, unkept, and dark. Behind the window, a silhouette of a face was pressed against it. The breath would create condensation every few seconds, but all I could make out were the reflections of those empty black eyes. I couldn't move, I couldn't scream, it felt like an eternity, the staring contest between me and this thing. Thoughts were repeating incessantly in my head. Why haven't they run away when they saw that I noticed them? What were they planning? Is this the face of death? After probably about 10 seconds of not doing anything, the hand slowly unclenched the window and receded into the darkness. The condensation on the window dispersed. Another couple of seconds passed before I heard the dreaded crunching sound melodically fading into the distance. But I still just sat there. I mean, what the heck just happened? Why didn't I do anything? Why am I still not doing anything? With that thought, my body shot into adrenaline. I pounded on my friend's seat, waking her up from her slumber into a dizzy confusion. I unlatched and kicked open the back door and took a moment to scan the area. Whoever they were, whatever that was, it was now gone. I scrambled to pick up any important camping supplies that we left outside and just sort of crammed everything into the back seat and trunk, periodically looking over my shoulder, listening for those footsteps. I slammed the back door shut and there they were, a grim reminder of the horror that just happened two handprints imprinted on the window. I quickly wiped them off the window in panic, a reaction to erase the event I guess, but I jumped into the front seat, started the car and floored it out of there. My friend finally coming to asked me what the heck I'm doing. Listen, we gotta go, I said. There's someone out there. I didn't see whatever or whoever it was while fleeing the scene. Speeding down the dirt road, my friend insisted that I slow down, and eventually, I did. We reached the highway, and I proceeded to drive 20 or so miles before we reached a Denny's where my friend asked for us to stop to eat and explain everything. The nightmares, they subsided a few months later. My embarrassment, it continues to this day, for the state of shock that I was in at the time, that is. Everybody says that you either have a fight or a flight instinct, but I'm confused whether I have either. I mean, I just sat there and pretty much did nothing. I frequently tend to ask myself who was out there. Another camper messing with us? A resident of the abandoned cabin down the dirt road? Or maybe something more... I know, it sounds ridiculous, but paranormal residing in the forest watching lone, vulnerable campers as they drift off to dreamland. We'd still go camping there in the years ahead, but we never went too far from the highway. Whatever it was, I hope that that was the last that I've seen of it.
So I'm a female living alone in a fairly safe apartment complex. I live on the fifth floor, and on my floor there's only my apartment, my neighbours, and a laundry room with a washer and a dryer. I know most of the tenants in my building, except for my neighbour. He's only been living here for like a week. I only know his name, but never really talk to him. I only know that he's an older guy from talking to another neighbour. Anyway, so at around 8 tonight, somebody rang my doorbell. Through the peephole, I saw a guy standing in front of my door, mid-40s I would guess. I thought that that's probably my neighbour. It's actually quite normal in our complex to go and introduce yourself, so I thought that that's what he was trying to do. I only opened the door a bit, because you never know, right, and left the chain on. He saw me, smiled, and said, hi, but didn't say anything after that. I was already a bit confused, so I just sort of said, hi, how can I help? He introduced himself as Bruno, didn't say that he was my neighbor or anything like that. I didn't say anything either, to be honest. And after a few seconds, he said, don't be afraid, I don't bite. I was ready to yeet the door closed because, I mean, what the heck, right? If somebody tells you to not be afraid of him, there's definitely something to be cautious about. But before I could close it, he came really close to the door and almost squeezing his head in the gap. I knew that I should have slammed the door in his face at that point, but I was just kind of, I don't know, shocked or something. But before I could do anything too, he asked, did you do this to my laundry? And I was like, what? He repeated, did you do this to my laundry? And at that point, I was super confused. Like, what was he talking about? I told him that I don't know what he's talking about, and he said something along the lines of, well, come and have a look, and pointed to the laundry room. And at that point, I just noped out and slammed the door shut, double locked it, and called my boyfriend. I saw the guy stand in front of my door for at least another minute through the peephole, before he left down the stairs. He didn't seem angry or anything, he just sort of had this weird blank expression on his face. My boyfriend drove to my place immediately. He checked for cars outside the complex, checked the stairwell, but he couldn't find the guy anywhere. We went to look for the laundry that he was talking about, but when I got there, there wasn't any. And... I know that he didn't take it with him because I saw him leave without any and look through the peephole the whole time until my boyfriend arrived. He asked me if I knew the guy or anything and I told him that initially I thought that it was my neighbor but wasn't sure. He went and rang my neighbor's doorbell and I watched him through the door and the guy that opened definitely was not the guy that rang my doorbell. He also didn't know anyone that matched the description. And I mean, even though he hasn't lived here for that long, it still wasn't very reassuring. Honestly though, this whole thing just creeps me out so much. Like, what would have happened if I went with this guy into the laundry room? What was he doing up here? Why target my room? Why target my apartment? I don't know, but uh, by the way... In my country, your surname is printed on the doorbell, but not the first name, so I don't know how he knew my name, and the whole thing is just really weird. What do you guys think I should do? I live in a three-story, four-bedroom new build house. Prior to it being a house, this plot of land was a residential home. Before that... I have no idea. So, myself and my partner and our young children have lived here since it was built, nearly six years. I've never felt anything bad or good in this house, except for the bedroom on the top floor. That bedroom was our youngest bedroom. That was her bedroom from about maybe six months old until two years. But she just never slept well, ever. She would always wake up during the night, sometimes crying uncontrollably. We just put it down to her being a terrible sleeper. However, sometimes if we couldn't settle her back down, we'd bring her into our room, which was directly next to the said bedroom, and she would just sit and stare into the hallway outside, 
and would refuse to be put down near the doorway. And if we tried to carry her out into the hallway to show her nothing was there, she would freak out. She no longer has that room as a bedroom. She shares with her older sisters now. The middle child, our boy, now has that bedroom, and he claims to feel fine in there. However, when it was our youngest bedroom, when she'd wake in the night, my partner would always go downstairs to make her a bottle, and I would go in and comfort her. And while comforting her with my back to the door, I would always, I don't know, feel like there was something or someone watching me. Anyway, that's the backstory, but during a conversation that we were having as a family tonight, myself and my partner were talking to the eldest boy, 15-year-old, and our youngest just so happened to sleep in her brother's room last night. He was at a sleepover at a friend's house and she wanted to escape the younger ones, but we asked her how she slept. It was a totally normal question, mind you. We certainly didn't lead her answer or anything. It was one of those, you know, how did you sleep last night sort of questions. We weren't prodding for anything is what I mean. And she said, well, not so great. I felt on edge, like someone was watching me from the doorway. I wasn't scared, but I felt anxious. And how she described her feeling was exactly how I felt in the past when I would often be in there comforting our youngest. Neither my partner nor myself have ever spoken to the children about this before, so there's no way that she was just regurgitating what we've said. But man, I felt a shiver go up my spine when my stepdaughter said this tonight because it was so accurate. My partner even immediately looked at me as if to say, wow, that's exactly what we've said. Anyway, I just wanted to share my story and see if anybody else can relate. A friend has just recommended that we invest in some selenite to place in and around the room. But does anybody else have any other suggestions and am I just overthinking this or is there something more to it? In autumn of 1995, when I was five years old... My parents moved us from suburban Dublin to a small town in a neighbouring county. Nowadays, that area would almost be considered suburban, but back then, it was the middle of nowhere, right before Ireland's economy started to really boom too. They bought a house that was about two kilometres from the village in a field surrounded on all sides by farmland, with a little cowshed directly touching the edge of our land. It had a long driveway up to the house, three-bedroom 1900s dormer bungalow, and as a suburban kid, I hated the place as soon as we moved there. My parents were into their late 20s, early 30s at that time. They both had grown up in the city and wanted to experience country life, so it was an opportunity to do a renovation. And when we moved into the place, it was rancid. Nobody had lived in this house for decades, and I remember the water running yellow from the taps and the kitchen being non-existent when we moved in and the heating wasn't installed yet. On our first Saturday there, I remember we watched what I think was Goldeneye. Could have been a trailer for it that I remember. I was only like five, so it's a little bit fuzzy. We watched it though beside an electric heater with duvets around a tiny TV. What I'm trying to say is that it was bleak at first. As it moved into winter though, my parents were renovating room by room and I experienced my first memorable snowstorm. Our electricity went out at one point and I do remember my mum trying to keep me chill while she lit candles and stuff. And over time, things did eventually get better and they renovated the upstairs room first. But when you walked up the stairs, there was one big room that we all put our beds into that connected to an attic space, which I remember helping my dad put rat traps in and that sticky bug tape onto. Anyway, over time they renovated all the rooms in the house and it turned out really nice in the end. It was very 90s with loads of bright colors and a country kitchen and all that. But my mother was really depressed there and this was the time before the internet took off and in Ireland at that time, once you left the cities, you only had like three channels and they were all Irish, which in 1995 was not a good thing. She just felt isolated, I guess, and I remember a few times she let me take the day off school and stay home even. I think that she did this because she was lonely though. Anyway, 
In August of 1996, they gave up and moved us back to the city. They bought a really nice brand new home right before house prices skyrocketed and I even got to rejoin the class that I had spent a couple of months with in 1995. In 2011, when I was 21, my dad and I went for a drive together and decided to drive back to that town. And he started telling me stories about that house and suddenly a, a bunch of experience that I'd had suddenly made a lot of sense. So, remember that big room upstairs? My whole life, I've had this sort of reoccurring dream where I'm lying in bed, my parents are downstairs with my family over, and as I close my eyes, I can see shadows moving in front of me between the hanging lights and the bed, as if someone is sort of walking back and forth in front of me. And I've had that dream maybe 20 times, I would guess. My dad told me that one of the major reasons they left was because they felt the place was actually haunted, apparently. This was obviously news to me, but my mum was already depressed being alone there while he commuted into the city every day, but that she also had experiences that made it very difficult for her to be alone by herself. But both of them had also experienced the shadows and the lights, apparently, and he told me that once she was brushing her teeth in the downstairs bathroom, it sort of felt a cold sensation, and then the back of her robe was pulled so hard that she dropped a toothbrush. But the bit that really freaked her out, apparently, was me talking to myself. My sister had been freaked out by this, too. One night, and I remember this clear as day as well, my parents had friends over, and I was playing in my bedroom, now downstairs, and I had an 80s arcade machine in my room that my dad had gotten somewhere. You didn't need to put change into it to make it work, but I remember very clearly that I was with a girl who wanted to know how it worked and stuff. And something happened, and she convinced me to get some change and try to force it in. I went to my mom and lied and told her that I needed one pound for the charity box school that they had given me. She gave it to me, and me and the girl tried to slot it in. My mom came in at one point, and she was really mad at me, because obviously I'd lied to her. I told her that the girl told me to, and my memory gets a bit foggy after that, but my dad in the car that night told me that there never was any girl apparently and that that wasn't the first time that I'd seen her. The other time I was playing in the front garden at the gate and my dad noticed me talking to myself. He came over and told him. He came over and apparently I told him I'm just talking to the girl. And I do remember him being like okay that's nice and not making a sort of big deal about it again that there was no girl. One time when they weren't looking and I was with her, she actually touched me for the first time. And this is the only time that I remember that I really thought as a kid that something was strange. She sort of touched my hand and then just immediately disappeared. I mean, I was five and I didn't know what had happened, but one minute she was there and the next she was gone and I had this incredible need to take off the t-shirt that I was wearing. It felt like that feeling when you know that there's a spider on you or something. I ran up to the house though and into my room and pulled my clothes off, stomping on them. My mum noticed this too, but I really don't remember anything after that. Anyway, the old house, the smells of rotten eggs and the birds constantly flying into the windows were creepy enough without all of that too, but it apparently really sunk in with my dad when he was at the mechanics in town one day making small talk and one of the lads said you're brave living in that place because apparently it had been abandoned for years and had been known locally as a very creepy spot that people would stop and look into on the country walks and stuff wondering about it when we eventually got back to it on our drive the place was once again abandoned and being used solely for storage by whoever bought it i think it still looks creepy to today and the travelers or gypsies who bought it have put a big religious shrine in front of the house. But there were also big sort of beech trees surrounding it and it had a proper gate and all that but 25 years haven't been kind to it, that's for sure. When I was 18 or 19, I decided to go metal detecting this park that was in the heart of the ghetto. Saying that this place is in a bad part of town too is really an understatement. 
There are regular shootings that occur at it, and the parking lot around the area is filled to the brim with dirty needles. And maybe I was stupid for detecting at this location, but I guess I just didn't care. I mean, I'd previously hit the spot and helped this old bum find a missing piece from his bicycle. But anyway, when I went here this time, it was like 4.30 in the morning. I drank like 8 cups of coffee and had this beat up rusty 1980s bounty hunter metal detector that my grandpa got at Radio Shack and left to me when he passed away. And I started on one side of the field and began moving across it in a, a sort of ruster scan sort of pattern. I found mainly just corona caps, pennies and sprinkler parts in the end but I was at about the middle of the field and got a hit that seemed like it could have been a dollar coin or a ring or something, so I started digging it. I dropped my detector on the grass and pulled out this really big knife that I had to start cutting a plug, and as I was digging, I sort of looked around me every few minutes to keep a good view of my surroundings. At one moment, I looked behind me and noticed that this older, heavy-set black dude sort of looked a bit like Wesley Willis, who was super far away from me, was starting to get a bit closer. I assumed that he was just a guy at the park, so I kept digging, but kept my eyes on him. It's worth noting too that he couldn't have seen my knife from the angle that he was at, just my detector and bag of findings. He started getting closer and closer to me, and I got really suspicious at this point. I started wondering what his deal was, and I don't think that he saw I noticed him, because just then... He started charging me, like running full force towards me as fast as he could, with his eyes aimed at my gear. I stood up as fast as I could, and he saw my knife, and immediately yelled, Oh man, I didn't mean any trouble, I'm sorry, I'm sorry man, and then just ran away super fast. To be honest, I was more confused by the situation than startled, I guess, but I still got out of there pretty quickly, because that after a little bit of reflection, could have been a very close call. Years ago, I moved to follow my boyfriend and to do a PhD in his country. I won't name the place, but it's an across-the-ocean type of deal. At first, I was very excited. It was a wonderful adventure. That is, until it wasn't. It's hard to describe the complexity of what I felt. I felt alone, misunderstood, far from my family and friends, and even though my boyfriend is wonderful, I really felt the weight of not finding any human connection. This could explain why I acted so weird and disconnected from reality in the following story. I'm also a very naive woman, and I like to see the best in people around me. This has been problematic more than a few times, but this story is maybe the worst example of where this candid attitude got me. So my boyfriend and I, we're into BDSM. We do it alone on our own and do not participate in events or anything. I do have an account on an own website. I go there to find new ideas for our sessions and I sometimes but rarely post pictures. No face, no tattoos, nothing like that. I get contacted by interested doms once in a while, even though I clearly state that I'm not free. Usually they send copy-paste messages, so I just ignore them. Once in a while, though, I'd get a more, like, personal message and make an effort to answer that I'm definitely not interested and that I'm in a relationship. And this is how my discussion with him started. He didn't approach me with, uh, will you be my sub, but with curiosity about how I got into BDSM, stating that he was quite new to the domain and was interested in understanding the way of life. So, I gladly explained. Explanations turned into discussions, and he told me about how he was in the police and that he investigated drug cartels. He also told me that he was married and that he had kids. Interestingly, we had a lot of hobbies in common too, like a lot. I won't go into details about those hobbies, but they're kind of specific. And feeling very lonely, combined with the fact that I felt like I could trust him because he was married and had kids, I accepted his invitation to start texting on WhatsApp. 
I want to be clear that my boyfriend knew about this from day one too. Plus, we had been talking on this website for almost three months before switching to WhatsApp. He was very friendly and interested by my day-to-day -day life. He'd share pictures of his kids and of investigations that he was working on. This went on for like another three months too. Then, one day, he told me that he had to do an interview of a suspect close to the town where I lived and asked if we could meet for coffee. I agreed, and we met for the first time. But before anyone panics, my boyfriend was hiking with friends for a few weeks. I texted him, but he didn't have a signal. Plus, we have a very trusting relationship. He has a lot of girlfriends, and back in my country, I hung out with a lot of boys. So this really isn't weird for us. But anyway, back to this first encounter. It felt as if we had known each other for years, to be honest. We had a great time from the beginning, and I was so happy that I'd found a friend far from my country, and he knew that I loved reading thrillers and enjoyed murder investigation videos, so he showed me his gear. Handcuffs, sampling kits for small investigations, other restraints, etc., it didn't feel weird at that moment, but afterwards, I kind of understood that this could have been a way for him to show off what he could do. However, as the night went on, after grabbing drinks from a nearby bar, he forced me against a wall and kissed me. I was shocked, really, and barely managed to push him off me. I told him that it was completely inappropriate, that he was married, and that I was in a relationship. He was really sorry and felt ashamed. He told me that he felt that there was something between us and I was like, yeah, it's called friendship. I was disappointed to say the least and we parted ways. Days later, after he apologized over and over again, he called me to meet up. He wanted to take me for a ride in his hometown. It's a pretty place. He's got a bike and he wants me to enjoy the scenery in his country that I barely know. And I agree. It is his hometown, he works there, he lives there with his wife and kids, surely I'll be okay. In short, I wasn't. Again, he kissed me, tried to push for more, in the middle of a park, mind you, a park where he brought his children to play on the weekends. So I told him to bring me back to the bus station so I could leave. He did and then proceeded to tell me a story about how he had recently got a drug seller out of hiding by modifying text messages sent by his girlfriend. He basically made him believe that she was cheating on him to get him to confront her and then arrested him. I don't know if it was true, I don't even know if it's possible, but due to what had just happened, what I heard was, I can make your boyfriend believe that you're cheating on him. And my boyfriend was still on his hike by that time. We did talk once every few days, and I told him everything about the moment that he had some cell signal. Meanwhile, I was confronting this guy about that. His behavior was really strange as he went from, I'm sorry, I think I'm in love with you, to if you tell the cops, who do you think they'll believe? Their colleague or an immigrant? I got scared and tried to cool things down with him. I just felt that he could go crazy at any moment. He clearly wasn't used to girls refusing him. At that point, I thought that it would be safer for me and my boyfriend to maintain contact with this guy, albeit with less enthusiasm than before. But after understanding how obsessed he was, I blocked him from all platforms where I knew that he had an account. But he found me. He even sent me my address, asking if I'd loved living in that particular part of town. And I never gave him my address. I guess that he could pull some strings at the station to get my info. He even came to visit me at my job at one point. I was so scared that I just played it as if everything was okay. I told him my boyfriend wanted me to cut ties with him because he was angry about what had happened, which was true, but I also wanted him out of my life. I didn't know how he would react if I told him, however. This guy insisted that I loved him, though, that I could be his mistress, that my boyfriend didn't have to know. He was obsessed by me and he didn't hide it anymore. He told me that he wanted to have me, how we'd be a great couple, how he'd father our children. He went from I'll be husband material to like a serial sex offender too in a matter of seconds. I refused again and again, blocking him, changing my accounts, you name it. I got scared though when I got calls from unknown numbers. 
I was terrified when I saw anyone slowing down on a motorcycle close to my apartment. I was wary of going outside and going to my job. The quarantine was actually pretty welcome for me, really, and I didn't get any news from him for months. And then I broke my cell phone, and I knew that I could transfer all of my numbers from one phone to another, but I didn't know that it would unblock previously blocked numbers. Days later, I got a message from him. He told me that he had divorced his wife, that he still loved me, that he wanted to marry me. He apologized for making me believe that I was only mistress material and that I was worth so much more. He said my boyfriend didn't love me, that I deserved better, that he was waiting for me. When he saw that I saw his message, he said, finally, I thought you'd never unblock me. So... Does this mean that he'd been sending this message over and over again in hopes that I'd finally see it? This narcissistic man used all of the manipulation tactics that he knew. He had told me before we met in person how he had learned those skills to toy with criminals, to have them tell the truth and admit crimes. Fortunately, I had dated manipulative men before and knew the signs. Basically, he wasn't used to not getting what he wanted. He was attractive, rich, interesting, and he knew that. I blocked him again, and we moved a few months later, and I just hope that he doesn't get his hand on this information. I believe that his last move was trying to hack into my Instagram, as I got a notification that someone from his hometown had tried to connect to my account. This obsessed cop who has chased me for over a year now, it's terrifying to say the least. So this was earlier this year. I moved to a different town and was finally settled into my new place. It was the night before Christmas and family was coming by early that morning so I spent the evening cleaning and prepping for the next day. All was well, I was in high spirits and crawled into bed. It was the first time that I was hosting Christmas, so I was a bit too anxious and giddy to fall asleep. I knew that I should sleep soon, but I was just wide awake, so I played on my phone a bit and just passed the time. It was about maybe 10pm or so. But then suddenly, I'm in the car with my husband on the highway and he's pointing at something in the sky frantically yelling, What is that? And the next thing I know is that I'm groggy and waking up and there's lights around me and a, a dark shadow and it feels like there's fingers pressing my temples and something is on my head. I vividly remember that feeling of dread and thinking, oh no, not again. I feel groggy but managed to mumble and lift my arm which was heavy and tried to say, I'm awake. I then just closed my eyes and wanted it to be over with and I remember thinking, I hope this doesn't last long. Suddenly, there's blackness, and I snap awake. I'm drenched in sweat. There are two points on my forehead that are throbbing in pain. I'm in my bedroom again, and everything as I left it. The TV is on, my phone is in my hand, and I'm thinking, man, that was a weird dream. Suddenly, there's a loud noise, and the power shuts off, leaving me in the dark. It scared me half to death as well and I jumped up and tried to wake my husband who was dead asleep. Finally, after a few seconds though, the power was back on and my husband thinks that I'm just silly. The thing is, is that I understand that it could very much have been just a dream. That's not impossible, I suppose, but I'm not much of a dreamer and if I do, they aren't that vivid. This one just felt so real, but... Why? And why aliens of all things? I'm mostly into like ghostly stories so I don't read or look up UFO stuff that much and I remember the physical feeling of dread that it was happening again and I could feel my stomach drop and I felt sick when I thought, not this again. But the strange thing is that I don't recall any other dreams or experiences like this. It's just so random. It was Christmas too, so I definitely wasn't thinking about aliens or anything. Anyway, I don't know what to think of any of this. I guess I'm just sharing it to get it off my chest and reaching out, I suppose. 
So, if you have any idea about what any of this could be, then please do let me know. I'm a security guard for an alarm response company. We answer alarms for businesses and private residences. 99% of the time it's just a motion detector set off by a cat or a restaurant forgot to disarm their stuff before the stock truck arrived to unload. Just stuff like that. But in this case, I was called out to a house where the back door alarm was set off. Like it thought that someone opened it. The owner was out of town but she was alerted by her app and had her mother meet me there. We checked the door and it's locked. We figured that maybe someone tried the door but it didn't budge, setting off the alarm. But there's a light on inside. The mum mentions this to the daughter on the phone. The daughter says that she isn't sure if she left the light on or not. It's a good idea to make people think someone's home but she just isn't sure. But that gave me a bad tingle. The mother wanted to go inside to check. However, she didn't have a spare key. The neighbor did, but they were asleep and mum didn't want to wake them. So I fill out my papers and go back to my normal patrol route. But an hour later, the same home sends out an alert. I'm the only one in my city zone, so I answer it again. And when I pull up, police and CSI are there talking to the mother and the now awake neighbor. They're reviewing the video footage sent to them by the daughter. I look at the footage and four armed men wearing masks and hoodies came out of the bathroom a minute after the mother and I left. They proceeded to rob the place. They had broken in and locked the door behind them for appearances, and they were the ones who turned on the light. The mother told me three guys had robbed her daughter's home about a month before this. Somehow they knew when this girl was going to be out of town. They appeared smart, desiring a, a quiet robbery without conflict. But they did bring guns, so they were prepared to shoot their way out of trouble if need be. Now, the mother had wanted to go in, and if she had had a key or woken the neighbor for the key, we would likely have been shot dead by these guys when we went inside. Work doesn't give me, like, Kevlar vests or anything like that, too, so it's pretty much guaranteed a death sentence. If I ever get another house call and someone is in there, I am not going inside no matter what is asked of me. I count myself fortunate the way this place was blocked this time because I was prepared to foolishly go in and check if I could. I will say though that the 1% of calls where something is actually off, it's never been as bad as this one. So I was around five to seven years old when this happened. I lived with my mom and my two sisters. I would see my dad on Wednesdays and Saturdays. We lived in a three bedroom, one bath house next to a funeral home. I used to share a room with one of my sisters and when I'd wake up in the middle of the night, I would always run into my mom's room and sleep with her because I was scared. So I come home one night from my dad's house after a short while of being home, probably 20 to 30 minutes, I decide that I'm going to act like I'm sleeping in my bed, and when my mum comes to check on me, I'm going to scare her. So I crawled into my bed, and for some reason, I just immediately passed out. I woke up at around 1.30 in the morning, I think. I ran to my mum's room, as I always did out of fear. I don't know why I was always scared in this house at night, but it was every night got in her room and for some reason she's not in there. I check the living room and she's not in there either. I then realize that she probably went to stay the night at her boyfriend's I think. I immediately booked it right back into my room though and I jumped into my bed. A few minutes pass and now I'm even more scared because I remembered that my sister who I shared a room with isn't here either because she stayed the night at her friend's house. After probably five minutes, I think, I start to hear pots and pans banging in the kitchen. When I heard this, I went under the blankets right away. 
And this goes on for another 10 minutes and the whole time it's happening I'm pinching and punching myself because I was convinced that I was dreaming, which I soon found out that I wasn't. A few minutes after, the continuous noise stopped. I came out from under the blankets and in the hallway, directly across from my bed, there's a man hanging there in my sister's room. I can see his head but I can't really see the rest of his body. I think he's wearing a blue tucked in dress shirt, black dress pants maybe, and black dress shoes I think. Right after I saw that though, I think I was just kind of scared into pure terror and I went back under my blankets and eventually I passed out again. I told my mom and my sister about it the next day and they were really freaked out. We moved out approximately maybe six months later into my mom's boyfriend's house. Now that I'm 18, I'm turning 19 soon, when I think back on when this happened, I think that there was something from the funeral home, considering how it was dressed. It's weird though because my friend's grandma lives in that house now and they haven't experienced anything. All I know is that that memory is going to stick with me for as long as I live. So I was in sophomore in high school when this happened, and I haven't gone back. It's midsummer in New England, and my best friend, his name's Andy, and I are just hanging out. I live on conservation land, so aside from the houses at the very front, there are pretty much no other developments, and woodland that spans for acres and acres. The state put down some paths, so I suggested that we go exploring one day. We geared up, I brought my pocket knife, sprayed down on bug spray, and headed out my backyard. Now, we hadn't explored too much, but I did know the area somewhat well, so we decided, to heck with the trails, but we're going to be real men and forge our own path. We enter the woods, thickly forested with pine, maple, and oak trees, and make notches in the trees on the way so we can find our way back. It's around noon, so I'm not too worried about it getting dark. After all, the sun sets around 8pm in the summer. But just in case, I keep track of it. We walk deeper and deeper into the woods, about 15 minutes, and the forest just seems to come alive. Bugs, frogs, birds, everything in this forest is loud. Slightly irritating, truthfully, but it's nice to take in the sights and the sounds, I suppose. But soon we stumble upon a peculiar scene. A perfect circle, probably 20 feet in diameter, that spans from the ground all the way to the sky. I'm perplexed, but Andy is curious, so we decide to go in. The first thing that I noticed, though, was that the overgrown weeds and the grass that surrounded us, they stopped at the perimeter. All vegetation past the line is just dead. Not bare, but just dead crunching under our feet. I don't just mean the grass either, but the tree limbs that extended in there are also bare, like leaves down the branch until it crosses this line and then they're just dead. Being the middle of summer, nothing should be dead and I've never seen a branch behave like that to be honest. It was at this point too that I'm beginning to feel an extreme unease I turn to Andy and ask him if he feels uneasy, and he says that he feels like we're being watched. I agree, and it's then that we notice the strangest sense that I've ever felt. The entire forest immediately goes silent. Not in rest, but in what feels like maybe suspense? Whatever the case, I'm feeling extremely uneasy now, and I know that we need to leave. We run out of there following our tree marks, and when we get back to my house, the forest is back alive. Ever since then too, every summer, every winter, a snarl of branches, sometimes leafed and sometimes not, sort of reveals a path through the forest there. I swear too that whatever was watching us from that circle that day, it continues to watch that path around that time of year. My 
My buddy B and I have been fox and coyote calling for some time now. If you're familiar with it, you place a sort of wiggly fake critter somewhere, play some distress calls or mating out loud, and when the time is right, you take a shot. It sometimes happens quick, it sometimes happens within 10 minutes, anything longer and you move on to the next area. So this night, however, we came across something that, well, it scared me half to death and we've avoided that area since. We were set up, jump in the back of a pickup truck and start calling. We already got one grey fox each at this time and we're hankering for another. Only this time, the wood is really quiet. I remember my buddy mentioning how creepy it was as we set up. After about 10 minutes, we turn the caller down and listen, looking around. There was nothing. He turns the caller up slightly and out of nowhere, we hear the most primal screech or call or sort of cackle that... I've ever heard. It was like one of those bird calls from the jungle, but it's really hard to explain. In any case, we freeze. I can see in my peripheral my buddy's eyes wide open, eyes darting back and forth, because like me, I thought it came from behind and above us. But the primal fear my body felt wouldn't allow me to turn around. B turns down the caller, the fake critter is still spinning and flopping around, we're basically looking at each other in our peripheral vision to see if the other heard it. And then, there were these two huge whooshes, what sounded like heavy wing flaps. A couple of branches above us rustle and snap. We both turn a 180, aim our rifles at the same spot in the tree above us. We have red light spots, my lights on our rifles and headlamps too. Only to see the branches slowly stop moving and a broken one swinging. Then there was a thump or a crash. We both turn another 180, rifles fixed on the area they were before. Only, instead of a fake floppy critter, we see this massive... All I really made out, to be honest, were... Well, they were wings. A huge, leathery reptile thing. They were sort of like huge, wide bat wings. I'm still not sure, but... We turned around just in the time to see this thing jump off the ground, flap its wings to gain altitude, and it was gone in a flash. And to be honest, all I can really picture is something like Batman from, well, the animated series. B and I sat there, rifles aimed, staring straight ahead, wide eyes, breathing heavily, not sure what just happened or what we saw. But 30 seconds later, about 100 yards ahead of us, our fake floppity critter drops from the sky, landing on the side of the road. It was mauled, mangled and crushed, and with a final sort of screech off in the distance, it was over. We wait about another 30 minutes and retrieve the caller and then we just skedaddle right out of there. To this day, we've convinced each other that what we saw was some sort of a ginormous owl, even if we joke about seeing something like pterodactyly, there's still a serious minute where we basically tell ourselves to just shut up. It must have been an owl. And we actually took a break from calling for a bit. So, years later, still hunting, trapping and calling, I now carry a harpoon gun with me every time and any time I enter my local woods. Whatever that thing was... It owes me a fake floppy critter and, in turn, I hope to hunt it and put it in my trophy case. So I was just driving home from a morning shift and was about a kilometer out from home when this guy stepped onto the road in front of me, waving his arms and shouting, stop, please stop. I slammed on the brakes to avoid hitting him, and he ran to my window. I've had similar things happen before when people need help after an accident, and I assumed that that's what this was. I ran down the window, and this guy said, Please, please help me. I'm being attacked. Please get me out of here. And I, being the credulous soft touch that I am, said, Sure, mate, get in. 
Now, I spend a lot of time in my car and my front passenger seat is basically my office and covered in just everything. So, not thinking, I told him to get into the back. This was lucky. So, this stranger is now in my back seat and I said, can I take you to the police station? What can I do? And he said, yeah, a police station, please. So I pull a U-turn and head to our nearest cop shop. Luckily, it's only about six kilometers away. At this point, I still think this guy has been legitimately mugged or something, and I ask what's going on. There's people after me. There's one there hiding in the bushes, and another one there on that side of the road, up in the tree. There's obviously no one there, and either the bushes or the tree. And I think to myself... Oh no, I've picked up a person in the middle of a psychotic break with gang-stalking delusions. Okay mate, well, let's get you to the police station and get you sorted, alright? I say, trying to sound reassuring and calming. And he seems responsive and says, thank you so much. Police station's just out on the main road, only takes us a minute to get there. And man, I have never wanted a cop car to appear in my rearview mirror so much in all my life. But only two kilometers to go now. We drive in silence for a minute when he suddenly turns his head on his side, looks at me, and says in this super deep growl, You're not taking me to the police station, are you? Yeah, mate, I say. Sure I am. We're almost there. Just hang on, all right? You're one of them, aren't you? This was your plan, wasn't it? I'm getting chased and you just happen to show up at just the right second? Where are you taking me? Let me out. He starts thrashing around in the back seat, pounding the cushions with his fists and flailing wildly. And just then, we come around a curve. And there is the police station. No, mate. Look, there's the police station there. We're turning in right now, okay? And we did. And he calmed down. He said thank you and ran inside as soon as I parked. I gave him a few minutes to tell his story to the cops, then went inside and told the desk sergeant what happened, just for context. I don't know exactly what was going on with this guy, but man, I'm so glad that I was close enough to that police station to get there in time. So before I begin, this guy has been fired and this whole story took place months and months ago. So I was hired to work at this auto shop as the front desk receptionist. My guy friend had worked there and had gotten me the job. I checked customers in, checked them out, answered phones, answered voices, blah blah blah. Now at this time I got hired, I was freshly 15. I do act mature for my age and all that stuff, but I was still technically a kid. I was also the only girl working there. Now, my two managers, their names are Peter and Alvin. Peter was my main boss and he had a dry sense of humor, but he was cool to be around. Alvin was more openly humorous and he was pretty pleasant in general, I suppose. And then there was this third guy... His name was Chester and he was 40 with a girlfriend, as well as a 13-year-old daughter. He was very uh, exuberant, very loud, he was quite funny, he was a bit annoying too, but this isn't the right place to talk about that. Anyway, it started off decent enough. He would tease me like a boy on the playground, like pull my hair, poke me, stuff like that. I laid my rules down when I first worked there. I hate being touched. And that was that. Now, Chester would get close to me as he humanly possibly could and say things like, I'm not touching you and laugh. It was annoying, but I just laughed it off. Although I did feel uncomfortable. And then he started with uh, kind of sexual jokes. When we were alone up front, he would talk about things. My brain was automatically like, this ain't right, and I just kind of put on my customer face voice whenever I was around him. But then one day, I baked the whole garage cookies, and when I dropped them off, he came really close to me and sort of sniffed me. He said, you smell good, and your hair looks nice this way. I was like, 
What? Did he just, like, do that? But when I went back to work, he was going on and on about the cookies I made. He said, I know cookie is another term for something inappropriate, but I really like your cookies. Why even add that, right? Anyway, now is my breaking point. He had started brushing his fingers against my leg when I'm sitting down, or just trying to flirt with me in general. When I came into work one day, he grabbed me into a hug, and my mind just sort of blanked. He grabbed me, like grabbed me into a hug so I couldn't escape. Eventually, I pushed him back away from me. Alvin had rounded the corner and had seen what had happened, and he looked a little bit uneasy. I went around the other side of the counter, away from Chester, and I said, I don't like being touched, dude. Don't hug me. And he said, well, touch is how I show my affection. So, not only did he ignore my attempt to tell him to stop, he also admitted to literally giving affection to a 15-year-old. I later heard from my friend that works in the garage that said Chester talked about the way that I looked and how I look older than I am, but that he doesn't want to start anything because his daughter was like two years younger. Start what, though? Chester was ugly. And, I mean, he was old. Anyway, Alvin had seen him grab me. The dudes in the garage heard him talk about me, and I knew this dude was, well, creepy to say the least. A guy in the garage, his name was Steve, pulled Alvin aside and told him that he was worried for me. He told him what Chester has been saying and how he looks to be flirting with me. But before this point, Alvin had thought that he had been too overprotective because he had daughters himself and maybe he was just having his father instinct or something. But when Steve told him that, it basically confirmed all of his suspicions. Chester was super gross and potentially evil. I ended up speaking to Alvin near the end of the day asking to stay after to talk to him about something. We stayed after and I opened up to him about everything Chester had been doing. Alvin said that what I do is more important than the work that he does. After that I went home and felt nice that my boss cared for me like a human and not just an employee. Peter, my boss, texted me to tell that everything's going to be okay and that he will be handled. I ended up meeting with Peter's dad, who was the big boss, to tell him everything. It was very much a, uh, we've known Chester for a long time, etc, etc, but big boss is a good man. He trusted my word more. I told him everything, and he actually had camera recordings of Chester grabbing me too. And after that, Chester was fired. I think the most traumatic thing to me, though, was how Chester talked about me in the garage, like some kind of a, an object. It was honestly disgusting, and then going back to the fact that he's 40 and I'm just two years older than his daughter, man, it was disturbing. I'm sure that if I wasn't such a confident person that he would have taken advantage of me. He was very much acting like a predator, and I'm really glad that he's no longer a part of that establishment. Anyway, I guess the moral of the story is, guys, teach your daughters to speak up when people make her uncomfortable, even the little things like weird jokes turn into something bigger sometimes. That's how it was for me anyways. Always enforce your boundaries and never ever let a guy get away with being a creep. So when I was young I was super into the paranormal and would read as many true life accounts as I could. Nowadays, the X-Files and the odd horror film are as involved as I get, but I would still love to believe these things happen. I also really love science, though, so I struggle to accept these things exist. That being said, this is definitely the craziest thing that has ever happened to me, and I've never had anything like it before or since. It might have just been a night terror, but anyway... Here's what happened. A few years ago, I'd been ill for a couple of days. I literally never get sick and it was a running joke at work that I'd never taken any sick days. I'd been feeling a bit grotty though and I had a, a fever so was finally off work for a day or two. Anyway, the night in question I remember being woken up because my bed was going up and down like a seesaw. 
I was super disorientated about what was actually happening, but it also seemed like the bed was in the air for this to be happening. But quite aggressively, there was a, a definite seesaw motion. That I remember. There was also a kind of whooshing or a rushing sound, and the best way to describe it, that I can think of anyway, is the white noise equivalent of light, if that makes sense. It was basically a total sensory overload. I was lying on my back trying to figure out what was going on, and my left arm was at a 90 degree angle to my side, stuck rigid against the bed. I remember looking at it and thinking, oh no, I can't move. It was almost anchoring me to the bed as all this was going on. And suddenly, my back goes rigid and I slowly sit up to a seated position in a perfect sit-up motion. Except, I can't do sit-ups like this. There's no way that I have the actual physical capability or core strength for that moment in the way that it just happened. At the same time, my head is tilted right back and my jaw is locked open in like a silent scream. I don't remember being scared because the whole thing was just really disorientating. I was pretty exhausted in general from being unwell, so fear seemed to require too much energy. But I remember the head tilt and the jaw lock and really stretching my physical capabilities in these moments. Then, as suddenly as it had began, it all goes silent and dark, the bed stops and I just flop back down. But just for a moment. Because then the bed and the noise and the light all start again. Except this time both my arms are stuck to the bed so I'm lying in a sort of cross position. I remember thinking very vividly that if I can get my arms free the whole thing will stop. This was like the only moment of clarity in the entire experience along with a less defined knowledge of something very bad causing this. I don't know what it was, of course, but all I could think was that, or maybe feel is the better word, is that this thing was very bad. There was also a less defined knowledge of a good force being around and freeing my arms was what I had to do to win this battle, as it were. Eventually, I managed to yank my arms free of being stuck, and at that moment everything stops and then I have a very brief moment of being a bit worried or panicked before I literally pass out and I guess go back to sleep. Now I've had dreams and nightmares lots of times but I've never had anything like this happen before or since then. It was an entirely different experience and I thought maybe a hallucination or my fever breaking but it was just some next level crazy, that's for sure. I also don't know if a fever breaking or a hallucination can do something like this. I'm inclined to believe that it was just a hallucination or a hyper-realistic dream, but I wasn't that ill and I've definitely been a lot sicker without the bizarre experience. Anyway, who knows what it was, but maybe it was just a night terror, though terror wasn't really a prominent feeling. Maybe it was a visit from an unfriendly something or other. Maybe it was aliens. I don't know, but I would like to hear what you guys think. So I was 15 when this happened. I was laying in bed watching TV. I had the house to myself as mum and went to get groceries or something. When the credits to the show that I was watching came on, I saw in the reflection of the black screen someone standing by my doorway. At the moment that I saw this figure, I froze. I was completely paralyzed with fear to the point that my head started heating up. I felt like I was about to faint to be honest, but somehow I racked up the nerve to turn my head and see if someone was actually there, and to my relief, there was nobody. I guess I must have just been seeing things. Or so I thought. I went back to watching TV when minutes later I received a text from my neighbor letting me know that Charlie, my dog, was out on the street. My neighbor is really old and has poor eyesight, so I assumed that he was mistaking Charlie for another dog. Nevertheless, I looked around to confirm that Charlie was indeed missing. 
After calling his name and receiving no response, I stood up and headed downstairs towards the living room, as Charlie likes to rest there, and on my way I noticed the front door was open. When I saw this, I instantly got chills. It was at this moment that I realized that the figure that I'd seen earlier wasn't just me seeing things. I immediately proceeded to walk out the door, but as I proceeded, the sound of footsteps running down the stairs could be heard from my position. I bolted out of there as fast as I could, and I ran straight to my neighbor's house. I told him what had happened, to which he responded by calling the police. The police came to my house, and they inspected the place. They couldn't find anyone, except for a switchblade that the intruder must have dropped as he bolted out of the house upon hearing the sirens of police cars about a mile away, I think. I think back to this day quite often, and I often think that if it wasn't for my neighbor's text, I'm sure that I would have made the headlines that evening. I live in Finland in a fairly small city and this happened to me a year ago when I was 14. So it was a Friday evening and on every Friday our mum lets us go to the store and buy some candy. So me and my 12 year old sister left our house to go to the store and it was already dark outside. We made our way to the closest store which was over a mile away. While walking at some point there's a man behind us walking the same way but I didn't think much about it at the time. He could just be going to the same store after all. So I continue chatting with my sister while the man is behind us, following us at a safe distance. We get to the store with no complications and the man followed us into the store. We take our time selecting our candy and get to the register to pay. While I was packing the candy into my backpack, I saw this man buying only a chocolate bar. It was a pretty far way to go for a chocolate bar, I thought, and at this point, my suspicions start to rise about this guy. I leave the store with my sister, and we start making our way back. We walked for a while, and I quickly glance at my back, and the man was still there following us. I took a look at my sister, who seemed totally unaware about the man's presence, we continue our walk, and up ahead of us was an unlit dirt road that continued for a good part of the trip, so I look at my back again, and there the man still was about 60 feet away. At this point, I was almost certain that he was following us, because on our way to the store, he didn't walk this part of the way behind us. The dirt road goes through a forest, and it had a curve at the start of it. Once we got to the curve... I look back and notice that the man can't see us, so I quickly pull my sister to the woods and we duck down in there. My sister is saying something and I just whisper, stay quiet to her as I wait for the man to come by. I could see the man's shadow sort of coming down the road and he started looking for us from the road. He walked back and forth on this road a few times and now I was certain that he was following us all that time. My heart was racing like you wouldn't believe, and I tried to be as quiet as possible. Thankfully, the man didn't find us, but continued running forwards. We stayed in the forest for quite some time before getting the courage to come out again. We walked the rest of the way home with no problems, and we get to our house. We eat our candy and have a good evening, but that really did bother me for a while, and especially my sister too. Thinking back on this still gives me chills and the thought of getting caught in that situation in the middle of the woods with no one around, it really creeps me out and I try not to think about it too much. I know for a fact that that guy was up to something no good and I'm just glad that I had the intuition to step into those woods when I did. So, it was the summer of 2004. I was 15 at the time and working weekends at a skate park, running the registers and keeping up shop. I was the only female employee there. The reason that I got the job, I thought at the time, was because I used to hang out there a lot prior to being offered a position. 
Now, they used to host events and sort of rock shows a ton. Those were extremely fun and the place where all my friends gathered for a good time, so we got to know the owners pretty well. The two guys that owned the shop were in their 40s, overweight, balding, typical older white guys, but they were extremely nice. Their names were Doug and Mark. Doug was always more serious about the business, always trying to come up with ideas to better it and rarely joking around. He was also married with kids. Mark, on the other hand, seemed like Doug's minion, I suppose. What I mean is that he was usually out running errands, making calls or cleaning the shop. He was a single guy, he was very outgoing and silly, so we always had fun with him around until, well, one day when the fun just stopped. Before I tell you about the scariest moment of my life, I think, I'll inform you of the events, or I'd like to call them red flags leading up to it. So, on one occasion, we were hosting a show where a local metal band was playing. There were lots of people there, kids and adults alike. They were skating and running up and down the ramps and the bowls and stuff, just generally having a good time. Then Mark suddenly came up behind me as I was talking with my friend Katie. And he all of a sudden just picked me up and swung me over his shoulder and started tickling and spinning me around, right in the middle of this crowd. I laughed it off and was yelling for him to stop in a sort of giggly way, but I was honestly a bit creeped out by that as he had never touched me before, even in a friendly way. Even at 15, I found this pretty inappropriate for a man in his 40s to be so touchy on me like that. But after about a minute, he put me down and was laughing and apologizing. To be honest, I didn't think much of it because, like I said, it was in a crowd and thought maybe I was just overreacting a bit. A week or two go by and I noticed Mark was giving me sort of flirty looks and sticking his tongue out at me when he was around. Again, I didn't think too much about it as he was a nice guy. I thought that he was just being funny. One day, though, Mark called me into the back. We had two doors right behind the register that led into our stockroom, as Doug sat at the register on a business call. When we got to the back room, he picks me up, sets me on the washing machine, and tells me that he wants to kiss me. I automatically shut him down, obviously, but he then tries to persuade to lift up my shirt. At this point, I'm really freaked out, and I'm just hoping Doug comes through those doors any second. Again, I firmly tell him no as I hop down and proceed to walk to the front of the shop. That's when Doug opens the door and asks, Hey, what are you guys doing? Did Mark show you our butterfly collection? I just responded with, Oh, uh, no, and I walk out. They both follow me. The rest of the day was pretty uneventful and uh, I just wanted it to end. Now, I usually got off work at around 6 or 7, but around 5, Doug asks me to go to Mark to run some errands. He jokingly said, take my credit card, but don't give it to Mark. All I could think about was how awkward this ride was going to be, as we hadn't talked since the incident earlier that day. I was really dreading this trip, to be honest, but I had no idea what was about to unfold. So we get in the car, drive to my high school, which is on the other side of town, in a medium-sized sort of busy city, but about five minutes away from my house. And as we pull in the back parking lot on a Saturday, I ask him what we were doing here. He responds by saying, I'm scouting out an area for a skate park, it's behind the school here. And this is when I start to get nervous, but hoping it's true because I did know that they were trying to expand locations at that time. He gets out of the car and motions for me to get out and come along. I hesitantly do so. We start walking to the back of the school and he's just talking about his visions of the new park and stuff. Nothing too serious. That's when we approach the woods though. Not a wooded area too, like straight up dense forest-like woods. But ones you could barely walk through in fact. And that's when he says, take my hand, come on, I'll show you the spot. And this is when the alarms went off of my head, and I realized that I could be in real danger if I go with this creep. In my head, I'm contemplating whether I should run or just go along with him, because I didn't know which one was about to make my situation worse at the time. 
This pondering seemed like it went on forever, when in reality it was probably only a few seconds. But thank God that I paused a second before making any decisions, because that was when my cell phone rang. I honestly forgot I even had it on me. It was my mum asking me if she could pick me up early so we could go to dinner. And that's when I tell her with a sense of urgency, yes, I'm at the high school, come and get me, now. I think she could hear the fear in my voice too and left immediately because she was there in less than five minutes. During those five minutes, I tell Mark that I have to go and wait on my mum. He seemed agitated by that but agreed and walked me to the front steps of the school to wait. He didn't say bye or anything, he just suddenly sort of briskly walked away to his car. My mum shows up a couple of minutes later, I hop in quicker than I've ever done anything in my life and I know that I must have been shaking. I tell her that I'm not in the mood to eat and just drop me off at home. She asks me if I'm okay and I said yes and that me and a co-worker were just there scouting for a new spot. I get dropped off at home eventually and I think I'm just in shock and full of fear. What I did next was I quit working there that very day. I just never went back. I didn't explain anything to anyone and I've only told my boyfriend and a couple of friends about this. But I'm 100% convinced looking back on all of the red flags and the fact that Doug didn't seem to trust Mark. Doug actually seemed like a good guy. That if I had went into those woods, I wouldn't be here today. Who knows what he would have done to me as well. It's weird when you survive something like this. It's never really seemed real to me, I suppose. But it very much was. These days, I actually have a 12-year-old daughter myself, and I try to teach her about safety and predators all the time. This kind of experience, it changes you, and... It changes the parent that you become too, I think. An update to this though was that about two years later, Mark called my house phone, I don't know how he got my number too, and told me that he was in Istanbul, Turkey and about to open a skate shop there. I just said, please don't call me anymore and I hung up. Luckily, my nightmare was over after that, but hearing from him was honestly like talking to the devil or something. In any case, I hope that that guy is in jail so that he can't hurt anyone else. I've always wondered if Doug ever found out about Mark and if maybe Mark had to flee the country for a crime that he committed, landing him in Istanbul or something, because going there in the first place seemed weird. Anyway, this turned out a bit longer than intended, but the point is, as a woman or a girl, especially, never trust anyone who's been a creep to you. In fact, I don't really trust much of anyone anymore. To tell you the truth, I really don't remember exactly how old I was when it happened. Probably six or seven, I think. I know that the war that was raging in my homeland had finally come to an end because my father had finally returned home, which had brought a smile back to my mum's face. They were finally able to visit relatives at the other end of the state, or those that survived, that is. And while they were away for the week, my grandmother looked after me. So that night, I was lying on my mattress in my little room trying to fall asleep. And just as I was drifting off to sleep... Maximilian, a dog that we had, started barking loudly. In a split second, the door to the room opened and then closed. And all of a sudden, I couldn't move my body at all. In fact, an unknown face could be seen through the outlines of the darkness. That figure, which now also had a body, sat on my chest and began to choke me. I couldn't breathe. Blood gushed from its eyes as it repeated over and over again, I don't want to see, I don't want to see. It was a woman's voice. Filled with just horror, I somehow managed to pull myself out of her bloody grip and rush toward the light switch. I quickly turned it on and when I did, there was no one in the room but me. I am drenched in cold sweat. I want to scream but no sound is coming out. That's when I noticed that there was black smoke suddenly coming out of thin air and it begins to fill the room. 
but no matter how hard I try, I can't open the door too. The smoke takes on what it looks like the form of faces or something, but the light is on. How is this possible? After looking at these faces for some time, eventually I just lose consciousness, I think. I wake up, curled up on the floor. I feel drained and really scared. Well, I just can't really explain it. Was it sleep paralysis? I don't know, but I'm convinced that I was wide awake when I turned the light on. Maybe maybe I was losing my mind for a, a moment or something? I don't know, but let me tell you that when I think about it, it definitely messed me up for some time afterwards.